Act 1. A representation at the Hotel de Bourgogne. A hall of the Hotel de Bourgogne in 1640. A sort of tennis court arranged and decorated for a theatrical performance. The hall is oblong and seen obliquely, so that one of its sides forms a back of the right foreground, and meeting the left background makes an angle with the stage which is partly visible. On both sides of the stage are benches. A curtain is composed of two tapestries which can be drawn aside. Above a harlequin's mantle are the royal arms. There are broad steps from the stage to the hall. On either side of these steps are the places for the violinists. Footlights. Two rows, one over the other, of side galleries, the highest divided into boxes. No seats in the pit of the hall, which is the real stage of the theatre. At the back of the pit, i.e., on the right foreground, some benches forming steps, and underneath, a staircase which leads to the upper seats. An improvised buffet ornamented with little lustres, vases, glasses, plates of tarts, cakes, bottles, etc. The entrance to the theatre is in the centre of the background under the gallery of the boxes. A large door, half open, to let in the spectators. On the panel of this door, in different corners and over the buffet, red placards bearing the words La Cloris. At the rising of the curtain, the hall is in semi-darkness and still empty. The lustres are lowered in the middle of the pit, ready to be lighted. Scene 1 The public arriving by degrees. Troopers, burghers, lackeys, pages, a pickpocket, the doorkeeper, etc. Followed by the marquises, cuije, brisaye, the buffet girl, the violinists, etc. A confusion of loud voices is heard outside the door. A trooper enters hastily. The doorkeeper, following him, Hello, you there, your money. I enter gratis. Why? Why? I am of the king's household cavalry, faith. To another trooper who enters, And you? I pay nothing. How so? I am a musketeer. The play will not begin till two. The pit is empty. Come. About with the foils to pass the time. They fence with the foils they have brought. First lackey, entering. Psst! Flonquin. Second lackey, already there. Sir Bell. Showing him cards and dice which he takes from his doublet. See, here are big cards and dice. He seats himself on the floor. Let's play. Doing the same. Good. I am with you, villain. Taking from his pocket a candle end, which he lights, and sticks on the floor. I made free to provide myself with light to be master's expense. A guardsman to a shop girl who advances. Twas prettily done to come before the lights were lit. He takes her round the waist. Second trooper, receiving a thrust. A hit. Clubs. Following the girl. A kiss. The shop girl, struggling to free herself. They are looking. Drawing her to a dark corner. No fear, no one can see. A man, sitting on the ground with others, who have brought their provisions. By coming early, one can eat in comfort. The burgher, conducting his son. Let us sit here, son. Ripple ace. Taking a bottle from under his cloak, and also seating himself on the floor. A tippler may well quaff his burgundy. He drinks. In the burgundy hotel. To his son. Faith. A man might think he had fallen in a bad house here. He points with his cane to the drunkard. What with topers? One of the fencers in breaking off jostles him. Brawlers? He stumbles into the midst of the card players. Gamblers? The guardsman behind him, still teasing the shop girl. Come, one kiss. Hurriedly pulling his son away. By all the holies. And this, my boy, is the theatre where they played Rotru erewhile. I and Cornelie. First page, second page, third page, hand in hand, enter dancing the farandol and singing. -la 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 the doorkeeper sternly to the pages. You pages there, none of your tricks. Oh, sir, such a suspicion. Briskly to the second page, the moment the doorkeeper's back is turned. Have you string? 
Aye, and a fish hook with it. We can angle for wigs then, up there in the gallery. The big pocket, gathering about him some evil looking youths. Hark ye, young cut purses, lend an ear while I give you your first lesson in thieving. Second page, calling up to the others in the top galleries. You there, have you any pea shooters? Third page, from above. Aye, have we, and peas with all. He blows and peppers them with peas. The young man to his father. What peace do they give us? Clarice. Who may the author be? Master Balthazar Barrow. It is a play. He goes arm in arm with his son. The pickpocket to his pupils. Have a care, above all, of the lace knee ruffles. Cut them off. A spectator to another, showing him a corner in the gallery. I was up there, the first night of the Cid. Making with his fingers the gesture of filching. Thus were watches. Coming down again with his son. Ah, you shall presently see some renowned actors. Making the gestures of one who pulls something stiltily, but little jerks. Thus for handkerchiefs. Montfleury. Shouting from the upper gallery. Light up below there. Bella Rose. Le Pay. Le Beaupre. Jodelet. Third page in the pit. Here comes the buffet girl. The buffet girl taking her place behind the buffet. Oranges, milk, raspberry water, cedar bitters. A hubbub outside the door is heard. First marquis. Make place, brutes. First lackey, astonished. The marquises? In the pit? Oh, only for a minute or two. Enter a band of young marquises. First marquis. Seeing that the hall is half empty. What now? So we make our entrance like a pack of woolen drapers. Peaceably, without disturbing the folk or treading on their toes. Oh, fie, fie. Recognizing some other gentlemen who have entered a little before him. Quiggy, Brisaye. Greetings and embraces. True to our word. Troth, we are here before the candles are lit. Ay, indeed. Enough. I am of an ill humor. Nay, nay, Marquis. See, for your consolation, they are coming to light up. Welcoming the entrance of the lighter. Ah! They form in groups round the lustres as they are lit. Some people have taken their seats in the galleries. Linie, a distinguished looking roux, with disordered shirt front, arm in arm with Christian the Neuvelet. Christian, who is dressed elegantly, but rather behind the fashion, seems preoccupied and keeps looking at the boxes. Scene 2. The same. Christian, Linier, then Draganou, and Libre. Le Gignier. Not drunk as yet? Aside to Christian. I may introduce you? Christian nods in assent. Baron de Neuviette. Bows, applauding as the first luster is lighted and drawn up. Ah! Quijet to Brisaillet, looking at Christian. Tis a pretty fellow. First Marquis, who has overheard. Pooh. Linier, introducing them to Christian. My lords de Quigui, de Brisaillet. Christian, bowing. Delighted. First Marquis to second. He is not ill to look at, but certes, he is not costumed in the latest mode. Ligné to Quigé. This gentleman comes from Touraine. Yes, I have scarce been twenty days in Paris. Tomorrow I join the guards in the cadets. Watching the people who are coming into the boxes. There is the wife of the Chief Justice. Oranges, milk. First violin, tuning up. Lala. Quigé to Christian, pointing to the hall, which is filling fast. Tis crowded. Yes, indeed. All the great world. They recognize and name the different elegantly dressed ladies who enter the boxes, bowing low to them. The ladies send smiles in answer. Madame de Guimene. Madame de Bois Dauphin. Adored by us all. Madame de Chavigny. Who sports with our poor hearts. Ah, so Monsieur de Corneille has come back from Rouen. The young man to his father. Is the academy here? Oh, I, I see several of them. There is Baudou, Boissat, and Curo de la Chambre, Pocheret, Colomby, Bourzet, Bourdon, Arbaud. All names that will live. Tis fine. Attention! Here come our Suisi, Barthenouad, Eurymedonte, Casadans, Felixiere. Ah! Oh. How exquisite their fancy names are. Do you know them all, Marquise? I, Marquis, I do. Every one. 
drawing Christian aside. Friend, I but came here to give you pleasure. The lady comes not. I will betake me again to my pet vice. No, no, you, who are a ballad-maker to court and city alike, can tell me better than any who the lady is for whom I die of love. Stay yet a while. Striking his bow on the desk. Gentlemen violinists. He raises his bow. Macaroons, lemon drink. The violins begin to play. Ah, I fear me she is coquettish and over nice and fastidious. I, who am so poor of wit, how dare I speak to her, how address her? This language they speak today, I, and right, confounds me. I am but an honest soldier and timid withal. She has ever her place there on the right. The empty box see you. Ligné, making as if to go. I must go. Detaining him. Nay, stay. I cannot. Thus you see waits me at the tavern, and here one dies of thirst. The buffet girl, passing before him with a tray. Orange drink? Ugh. Milk? Ha. Huh. Reeve salt? Stay. To Christian. I will remain a while. Let me taste this Reeve salt. He sits by the buffet. The girl pours some out for him. At the entrance of a plump little man, joyously excited. Ah, ah Ragnaud! Ragnaud! To Christian. Tis the famous tavern keeper, Ragnaud. Ragnaud, dressed in the Sunday clothes of a pastry cook, going up quickly to Linier. Sir, have you seen Monsieur de Cyrano? Introducing him to Christian. The pastry cook of the actors and the poets. Overcome. You do me too great honor. Nay, hold your peace, Messinas, that you are. True, these gentlemen employ me. On credit, he is himself a poet of a pretty talent. So they tell me. Mad after poetry. Tis true that, for a little ode. You give a tart. Oh, a tart let. Brave fellow. He would fain, fain excuse himself. And for a triolet now, did you not give in exchange? Some little rolls. Severely. They were milk rolls. And as for the theatre which you love? Oh, to distraction. How pay you your tickets, huh? With cakes. Your place tonight. Come, tell me in my ear, what did it cost you? Four custards and fifteen cream puffs. He looks around on all sides. Monsieur de Cyrano is not here. Tis strange. Why so? Montfleury plays. Aye, tis true that that old wine barrel is to take Fidon's part tonight. But what matter is that to Cyrano? How? Know you not? He has got a hot hate for Montfleury, and so has forbid him strictly to show his face on the stage for one whole month. Drinking his fourth glass? Well? Montfleury will play. He cannot hinder that. Oh, oh, that I have come to see. Who is this Cyrano? A fellow well skilled in all tricks of fence. Is he of noble birth? Aye, noble enough. He's a cadet in the guards. Pointing to a gentleman who is going up and down the hall as if searching for someone. It is his friend Le Bret yonder who can best tell you. He calls him. Le Bret. Le Bret comes towards them. Seek you for the Bergerac. I, I am uneasy. Is it not true that he is the strangest of men? True, that he is the choicest of earthly beings. Poet. Soldier. Philosopher. Musician. And of how fantastic a presence. Marriage would puzzle even our grim painter, Philippe de Campagne, to portray him. Methinks, whimsical, wild, comical as he is, only Jacques Callot, now dead and gone, had succeeded better, and had made of him the maddest fighter of all his visored crew, with his triple-plumed beaver and six-pointed doublet, the sword-point sticking up neath his mantle like an insolent cocktail. He's prouder than all the fierce artabans of whom Gascony has ever been and will ever be the prolific alma mater. Above his toby ruff he carries a nose. Ah, good my lords, what a nose is his! When one sees it, one is fain to cry aloud, Nay, it is too much, he plays a joke on us. Then one laughs, says, He will anon take it off. But no, Monsieur de Bergerac always keeps it on. Throwing back his head, he keeps it on, and cleaves in two any man who dares remark on it. His sword, tis one half of the fate shears. Shrugging his shoulders. He will not come. I say he will, and I wager a foul, a la Ragnaud. 
<laughs> Good. Murmurs of admiration in hall. Roxon has just appeared in her box. She seats herself in the front, the duenna at the back. Christian, who is paying the buffet girl, does not see her entrance. Ah, gentlemen, she is fearfully, terribly ravishing. When one looks at her, one thinks of a peach smiling at a strawberry. And what freshness! A man approaching her too near might chance to get a bad chill at the heart. Raising his head, sees Roxon and catches Linie by the arm. Tis she. Ah, is it she? Aye. Tell me quick, I am afraid. Tasting's river salte in sips. Magdalene Roba. Roxanne, so called. A subtle wit, a precieuse. Woe is me. Free? An orphan? The cousin of Cyrano, of whom we were now speaking. At this moment, an elegant nobleman, with blue ribbon across his breast, enters the box and talks with Roxan, standing. Who is yonder man? Who has become tipsy, winking at him. Aha, Comte de Guiche, enamoured of her, but wedded to the niece of Armand de Richelieu would fain marry Roxanne to a certain sorry fellow, one Monsieur de Valvere, a viscount and <laughs> accommodating. She will not have that bargain, but de Guiche is powerful and can persecute the daughter of a plain, untitled gentleman. <laughs> More by token, I myself have exposed this cunning plan of his to the world in a song which, <gasps> oh, he must rage at me. The end hit home. <gasps> Listen. He gets up staggering and raises his glass, ready to sing. No, good night. Where go you? To Monsieur de Valvet. Have a care. It is he who will kill you. Showing him Roxanne by a look. Stay where you are. She is looking at you. It is true. He stands looking at her. The group of pickpockets, seeing him thus, head in air and open-mouthed, draw near to him. Tis I who am going. I am athirst. And they expect me in the taverns. He goes out reeling. Lebre, who has been all round the hall, coming back to Ragano, reassured. No sign of Cyrano. All the same. A hope is left to me that he has not seen the playbill. Begin, begin, begin. Scene three. The same. All but Linier, de Guiche, Valver, then Montfleury. First Marquis, watching de Guiche, who comes down from Roxanne's box and crosses the pet surrounded by obsequious noblemen, among them the Viscount de Valver. He pays a fine court, your de Guiche. Four, another Gascon. Aye, but the cold, supple Gascon, that is the stuff success is made of. Believe me, we had best make our bow to him. They go toward de Guiche. What fine ribbons! How call you the colour, Count de Guiche? Kiss me, my darling, or timid fawn. Tis the colour called sick Spaniard. Faith! The colour speaks truth, for thanks to your valour, things will soon go ill for Spain and Flanders. I go on the stage. Will you come? He goes toward the stage, followed by the marquises and gentlemen. Turning, he calls. Come you, Valver. Christian, who is watching and listening, starts on hearing this name. The Viscount, ah, I will throw full in his face my... He puts his hand in his pocket and finds there the hand of a pickpocket who is about to rob him. He turns round. Hey! Oh! Holding him tightly. I was looking for a glove. Smiling piteously. And you find a hand. Changing his tone quickly and in a whisper. Let me but go and I will deliver you a secret. Still holding him. What is it? Linier, he who has just left you. Same play. Well? His life is in peril. A song writ by him has given offence in high places, and a hundred men, I am of them, are posted to-night. A hundred men? By whom posted? I may not say. A secret. Shrugging his shoulders. Oh. With great dignity. Of the profession. Where are they posted? At the port de Nestle, on his way homeward. Warn him. Letting go of his wrists. But where can I find him? Run round to all the taverns, the golden wine press, the pine cone, the belt that bursts, the two torches, the three funnels, and at each leave a word that shall put him on his guard. Good. I fly. Ah, the scoundrels, a hundred men against one. Looking lovingly at Roxanne. Ah, to leave her. Looking with rage at Valver. 
and him. But save Vinier, I must. He hurries out. De Guiche, the Viscount, the Marquises have all disappeared behind the curtain to take their places on the benches placed on the stage. The pit is quite full. The galleries and the boxes are also crowded. Begin! The burgher, whose wig is drawn up on the end of a string by a page in the upper gallery. My wig! He is bald! Bravo, pages! Ha ha ha! Furious, shaking his fist. Young villain! <laughs> <laughs> Total silence. What means this sudden silence? A spectator says something to him in a low voice. Is it true? I have just heard it on good authority. Murmur spreading through the hall. Hush! Is it here? No. Aye, I say. In the box with the bars in front. The cardinal. The cardinal. The cardinal. The devil. We shall have to behave ourselves. A knock is heard upon the stage. Everyone is motionless. A pause. Cuije, in the silence behind the curtain, snuff that candle. Putting his head through the opening in the curtain, a chair. A chair is passed from hand to hand over the heads of the spectators. The marquis take it and disappears after blowing some kisses to the boxes. Silence! Three knocks are heard on the stage. The curtain opens in the center tableau. The marquises, in insolent attitudes, seated on each side of the stage. The scene represents a pastoral landscape. Four little lustres light the stage. The violins play softly. Libre, in a low voice to Raganu. Montfleury comes on the scene. Aye, tis he who begins. Cyrano is not here. I have lost my wager. Tis all the better. An air on the drone pipes is heard, and Montfleury enters, enormously stout, in an Arcadian shepherd's dress, a hat breathed with roses drooping over one ear, blowing into a ribbon drawn pipe, applauding. Bravo, Montfleury! 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 Montfleury, after bowing low, begins the part of Fedon. Heureux qui loin des cours, dans un lieu solitaire, se prescrit à soi-même un exil volontaire, et qui, lorsque Zéphyr a soufflé sur les bois, Cyrano, from the middle of the pit. Villain, did I not forbid you to show your face here for a month? General Stupor, everyone turns round, murmurs. Hey! What? What is it? The people stand up in the boxes to look. To see. Cyrano. King of clowns, leave the stage this instant. Oh! But, do you dare defy me? Different voices from the pit and the boxes. Peace. Enough. Play on, Montefiore. Fear nothing. In a trembling voice. Heureux qui loin des cours dans un lieu sol. More fiercely. Well, chief of all the blackguards, must I come and give you a taste of my cane? A hand holding a cane starts up over the heads of the spectators. In a voice that trembles more and more. Heureux qui. The cane is shaken. Off the stage. Oh. oh. Choking. Heureux qui loin des cours. Cyrano, appearing suddenly in the pit, standing on a chair, his arms crossed, his beaver cocked fiercely, his moustache bristling, his nose terrible to see. Ah, I shall be angry in a minute. Sensation. Scene 4. The same. Cyrano, then Belarus, Jodelet. Montfleury to the Marquises. Come to my help, my lords. Carelessly. Go on, go on. Fat man, take warning. If you go on, I shall feel myself constrained to cuff your face. Have done? And if these lords hold not their tongue, shall feel constrained to make them taste my cane. Rising. Enough. Enough. Montfleury. If he goes not quick, I will cut off his ears and slit him up. But? Out he goes. Yet? Is he not gone yet? He makes the gesture of turning up his cuffs. Good. I shall mount the stage now, buffet-wise, to carve this fine Italian sausage thus. Trying to be dignified. You outrage Thalia in insulting me. Very politely. If that muse, sir, who knows you not at all, could claim acquaintance with you, all believe, seeing how urn-like, fat, and slow you are, that she would make you taste her buskin's soul. Not very, not very. 
Come, Burrows play. To those who are calling out, I pray you have a care. If you go on, my scabbard soon will render up its blade. The circle round him widens. Drawing back, to hear him. Cyrano to Montfleury. Leave the stage. Coming near and grumbling. Oh. Did someone speak? They draw back again. First lackey, singing at the back. Monsieur de Cyrano, this place is tyrannies. The big for tyrants, what who come play us la Clorise. La Clorise, la Clorise. Let me but hear once more that foolish rhyme, I slaughter every man of you. Oh, Samson. Yes, Samson. Will you lend your jawbone, sir? A lady in the boxes. Outrageous. Scandalous. Tis most annoying. Fair good sport. Silence. I order. Meow. I order silence all, and challenge the whole pit collectively. I read your names. Approach, young heroes, here, each in his turn. I cry the numbers out. Now which of you will come to ope the lists? You, sir? No. You? No. The first duelist shall be dispatched by me with honors due. Let all who long for death hold up their hands. A silence. Modest. You fear to see my naked blade? Not one name? Not one hand? Good. I proceed. Turning toward the stage, where Montfleury waits in an agony. The theatre's too full, congested. I would clear it out. If not... Puts his hand on his sword. The knife must act. Aye. Cyrano leaves his chair and settles himself in the middle of the circle which has formed. I will clap my hands thrice, thus. Full moon. At the third clap, eclipse yourself. Ah! Clapping his hands. One. I. A lady in the boxes. Stay. 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 I think, gentlemen. Two. I think we're wisest. Three. Montfleury disappears as through a trap. Tempest of laughs, whistling cries, etc. Coward, come back. back. Cyrano, delighted, sits back in his chair, arms crossed. Come back, and if you dare. Call for the orator. Belarus comes forward and bows. Ah, here is Belarus. My noble lords. No, 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 no. Advancing, speaking through his nose. Calves. Ah, ah bravo. bravo. Good, good. Go, go on. Go on. Go on. No bravos, sirs. The fat tragedian whom you all love felt. Coward. Was obliged to go. Come, Come back. back. No. Yes. yes. The young man to Cyrano. But pray, sir, for what reason? Say, hate you, Monfleur? Graciously, still seated. Youthful gander, no, I have two reasons. Either will suffice. Primo, an actor villainous, who mouths and heaves up like a bucket from a well, the verses that should bird-like fly. Secundo, that is my secret. The burgher behind him. Shameful, you deprive us of the Clarice. I must insist. Turning his chair toward the burgher, respectfully. Old mule, the verses of old Barrow are not worth a dwat. I'm glad to interrupt. A lady in the boxes. A Barrow, my dear, how dares he venture? Turning his chair toward the boxes gallantly. Fairest ones. Radiate bloom, hold to our lips the cup of dreams intoxicating, heave-like, or when death strikes, charm death with your sweet smiles, inspire our verse, but criticize it not. We must give back the entrance fees. Turning his chat toward the stage. Berros, you make the first intelligent remark. Would I rend Thespi's sacred mantle? Nay. He rises and throws a bag on the stage. Catch then the purse I throw and hold your peace. Ah! Whoa! Catching the purse dexterously and weighing it. At this price, you've authority to come each night and stop, Clarice, sir. Ho, 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 ho. 
even if you chase us in a pack. Clear out the hall. Get you all gone at once. The people begin to go out while Cyrano looks on with satisfaction. But the crowd soon stop on hearing the following scene and remind where they are. The women, who with their mantles on, are already standing up in the boxes, stop to listen and finally reseat themselves. Libre to Cyrano. Tis mad. The board coming up to Cyrano. The actor Monfleury. Tis shameful. Why, he's protected by the Duke of Condal. Have you a patron? No. No patron? None. What? No great lord to shield you with his name? No. I have told you twice. Must I repeat? No. No protector. His hand on his sword. A protectress. Here. But you must leave the town. Well, that depends. The duke has a long arm. But not so long as mine. When it is lengthened out. Shows his sword. As thus. You think not to contend? Tis my idea. But. Show your heels. Now. But I. Or tell me why you stare so at my nose. Staggered. I. Walking straight up to him. Well, what is there strange? Drawing back. Your grace mistakes. How now? Is it soft and dangling like a trunk? Simply. I never. Is it crooked like an owl's beak? I. Do you see a wart upon the tip? Nay. Or a fly that takes the air there? What is there to stare at? Oh. What do you see? But I was careful not to look. Knew better. And why not look at it? And if you please. I was. Oh, it disgusts you. Sir. Its hue unwholesome seems to you. Sir. Or its shape. No, on the contrary. Why then that air disparaging? Perchance you think it large? Stammering. No, small, quite small. Minute? Minute? What now? Accuse me of a thing ridiculous? Small, my nose? Heaven help me. Tis enormous. Old flathead, empty-headed meddler, know that I am proud possessing such appendus. Tis well known a big nose is indicative of a soul affable and kind and courteous. Liberal, brave, just like myself, and such as you can never dare to dream yourself, rascal contemptible. For that witless face that my hand soon will come to cuff is all as empty. He cuffs him. I Of pride of aspiration, of feeling, poetry, of godlike spark, of all that appertains to my big nose. He turns him by the shoulders, suiting the action to the word, as what my boot will shortly come and kick. Running away. Help! Call the guard! Take notice, boobies all, who find my visage's center ornament a thing to jest at, that it is my wont, and if the jester's noble, Ere we part, to let him taste my steel and not my boot. De Guiche, who with the Marquises has come down from the stage. But he becomes a nuisance. The Viscount de Valve, shrugging his shoulders. Swaggerer. Will no one put him down? No one? But wait. I'll treat him to one of my quips. See here. He goes up to Cyrano, who is watching him, and with a conceited air. Sir, your nose is... Hmm... It is very big. Very. Ha! Is that all? What do you mean? Ah, uh, no, young blade. That was a trifle short. You might have said at least a hundred things by varying the tone. Like this, suppose... Aggressive. Sir, if I had such a nose, I'd amputate it. Friendly. When you sup, it must annoy you dipping in your cup. You need a drinking bowl of special shape. Descriptive. Tis a rock, a peak, a cape, a cape forsooth. Tis a peninsula. Curious, how serves that oblong capsular? For scissor sheath? Or pot to hold your ink? Gracious, you love the little birds, I think. I see you've managed with a fond research to find the tiny claws a roomy perch. Truculent, when you smoke your pipe, Suppose that the tobacco smoke spouts from your nose. Do not the neighbors, as the fumes rise higher, cry terror-struck. The chimney is afire. Consider it. Take care your head bowed low by such a weight, lest head or heels you go. Tender. Pray get a small umbrella made, lest its bright color in the sun should fade. Pedantic. 
that beast Aristophanes, names Hippocamel Elephantiles, must have possessed just such a solid lump of flesh and bone beneath his forehead's bump. Cavalier, the last fashion friend, that hook, to hang your hat on, tis a useful crook. Emphatic, no wind, O oh majestic nose, can give thee cold, save when the mistral blows. Dramatic, when it bleeds what a red sea. Admiring, sign for perfumery. Lyric, is this a conch, a triton you? Simple, when is the monument on view? Rustic, that thing a nose, merry come up, tis a dwarf pumpkin or prize turnip. Military, point against cavalry. Practical, put it in a lottery, assuredly it would be the biggest prize. Or parodying Pyramus's size, behold the nose that mars the harmony of its master's fizz, blushing its treachery. Such, my dear sir, is what you might have said, had you of wit or letters the least jot. But, O oh, most lamentable man of wit, you never had an atom, and of letters, you have three letters only. They spell A-S-S, -S, ass. And had you had the necessary wit to serve me all the pleasantries I quote before this noble audience, in so you would not have been let to utter one. Nay, not the half or quarter of such jest. I take them from myself, all in good part, but not from any other man that breathes. Trying to draw away the dismayed Viscaw. Come away, Vicom. Choking with rage. Hear his arrogance. A country lout who, who has got no gloves, who goes out without sleeve knots, ribbons, lace. True, all my elegances are within. I do not prank myself out, puppy-like. My toilet is more thorough if less gay. I would not sally forth half-washed out a front upon my cheek. A conscience, yellow-eyed, bilious from its sodden sleep, a ruffled honor, scruples grimed and dull. I show no bravery of shining gems. Truth, independence are my fluttering plumes. Tis not my form I lace to make me slim. But brace my soul with efforts as with stays, covered with exploits, not with ribbon knots. My spirit, bristling high like your mustaches, I, traversing the crowds and chattering groups, make truth ring bravely out like clash of spurs. But, sir! I wear no gloves, and what of that? I had one, remnant of an old worn pair, and knowing not what else to do with it, I threw it in the face of some young fool. Base scoundrel! Rascally, flat-footed lout! Taking off his hat and bowing as if the Viscount had introduced himself. Ah! And I, c'est que nous savions écule de Bejrac. Laughter. Buffoon! Calling out as if he had been seized with a cramp. Ay! Ay! Who was going away, turns back. What on earth is the fellow saying now? With grimaces of pain. It must be moved. It's getting stiff, I vow. This comes of leaving it in idleness. I. What ails you? The cramp. Cramp in my sword. Drawing a sword. Good. You shall feel a charming little stroke. Contemptuously. Poet. I. Poet, sir. In proof of which, while we fence, presto, all extempore, I will compose a ballad. A ballad? Belike you know not what a ballad is. But... Reciting as if repeating a lesson. Know then that the ballad should contain three eight first couplets. Stamping. Oh! Still reciting. And an avoir of four lines. You! I'll make one while we fight and touch you at the final line. No. No? Declaiming. The duel in Hotel of Burgundy fought by Du Bejrac and a good for naught. What may that be, and if you please? The title. Give, Give room. room. Good sport. Make place. Fair play. No noise. Table. A circle of curious spectators in the pit. The marquises and officers mingled with the common people. The pages climbing on each other's shoulders to see better. All the women standing up in the boxes. 
to the right, De Guiche and his retinue, left, Libre Ragano, Cyrano, etc., shutting his eyes for a second. Wait while I choose my rhymes. I have them now. He suits the action to each word. I gaily doff my beaver low. And freeing hand and heel, my heavy mantle off I throw, and I draw my polished steel. Graceful as Phoebus, round I wheel, alert as Scaramouch. A word in your ear, sir, spark I steal, at the envoi's end I touch. They engage. Better for you had you lain low, where skewer my cock in the heel, in the heart, your ribbon blew below in the hip and make you kneel. Oh, for the music of clashing steel! What now? A hit? Not much. Twill be in the punch the stroke I steal when at the envoi I touch. Oh, for a rhyme, a rhyme, and oh, you wriggle, starch white, my eel. A rhyme, a rhyme, the white feather you show. Tuck. I parry the point of your steel. The point you hope to make me feel, I open the line, now clutch. Your spit, Sir Scullion, slow your zeal. At the envoi's end, I touch. He declaimed solemnly, Envoi, Prince, pray heaven for your soul's wheel. I move apace, lo, such and such. Cut over, faint. Trusting. What ho, you real! The Viscon Stragos, Cyrano salutes. At the envoi's end, I touch. Acclamations, applause in the boxes. Flowers and handkerchiefs are thrown down. The officers surround Cyrano, congratulating him. Ragano dances for joy. Libre is happy, but anxious. The Viscon's friends hold him up and bear him away. Ah! Tis superb! A pretty stroke! A marvel! A novelty! Oh, madman! Presses round Cyrano, chorus of Compliments! Compliments. Bravo. Bravo! Let me congratulate! Quite unsurpassed! There is a hero for you! Advancing to Cyrano with outstretched hand. Sir, permit! Not could be finer! I'm a judge, I think! I stamped the faith! To show my admiration. He goes away. To Quigi. Who is that gentleman? Why, D'Artagnan. To Cyrano, taking his arm. A word with you. Wait, let the rabble go. To Belarus. May I stay? Respectfully. Without doubt. Cries are heard outside. Jodelet, who has looked out. They hoot Montfleury. Solemnly. Sick transit. To the portus. Sweep, close all, but leave the lights. We sup, but later on we must return for a rehearsal of tomorrow's farce. Jodelet and Belarus go out, bowing low to Cyrano. The porter to Cyrano. You do not dine, sir? No. The porter goes out. Because? Proudly. Because? Changing his tone as the porter goes away. I have no money. With the action of throwing a bag. How? Oh, the bag of crowns? Paternal bounty in a day thou sped. How live the next month? I have nothing left. Folly! But what a graceful action! Think! The buffet girl, coughing behind her counter. <clears throat> Cyrano and Libre turn. She comes timidly forward. Sir, my heart mislikes to know you fast. Showing the buffet. See, all you need. Serve yourself. Taking off his hat. Gentle child, although my Gascon pride would else forbid, to take the least bestowal from your hands, by fear of wounding you outweighs that pride, and bids accept. He goes to the buffet. A trifle. These few grapes. She offers him the whole bunch. He takes a few. Nay, but this bunch. She tries to give him wine, but he stops her. A glass of water, fair. And half a macaroon. He gives back the other half. What foolery. Take something else. I take your hand to kiss. He kisses her hand as though she were a princess. Thank you, kind sir. She curtsies. Good night. She goes out. Scene 5. Cyrano, Libre. Now talk. I listen. 
he stands at the buffet and placing before him first the macaron dinner then the grapes dessert then the glass of water wine he seats himself so and now to table ah i was hungry friend nay ravenous eating you said these fops would be belligerent will if you heed them only turn your head ask people of good sense if you would know the effect of your fine insolence finishing his macaron enormous the cardinal radiant the cardinal was there must have thought it original if faith but he's an author twill not fail to please him that i should mar a brother author's play you make too many enemies by far eating his grapes how many think you i have made to-night forty no less not counting ladies count montfleury first the bourgeois then de guiche the viscount baron the academy enough i am o'erjoyed but these strange ways where will i lead you at the end explain your system come i in a labyrinth was lost too many different paths to choose i took which oh by far the simplest path decided to be admirable in all shrugging his shoulders so be it but the motive of your hate to montfleury come tell me rising this silenus big-bellied coarse still deems himself a peril a danger to the love of lovely ladies and while he sputters out his actor's part makes sheep's eyes at their boxes goggling frog i hate him since the evening he presumed to raise his eyes to hers beseemed i saw a slug crawl slavering or a flower's petals stupefied how now what can it be laughing bitterly <laughs> that i should love changing his tone i love and may i know you never said come now bethink you the fond hope to be beloved even by some poor graceless lady is by this nose of mine for i bereft me this lengthy nose which go wherever i will pokes yet a quarter mile ahead of me but i may love and who tis fate's decree i love the fairest how were it otherwise the fairest ay the fairest of the world most brilliant most refined most golden-haired who is this lady she's a danger mortal all unsuspicious full of charms unconscious like a sweet perfumed rose a snare of nature within whose petals cupid lurks in ambush he who has seen her smile has known perfection instilling into trifles grace's essence divinity in every careless gesture not venus herself can mount her conch blown seaward as she can step into her chaise of potiers nor diane fleet across the woods spring flowered light as my lady o'er the stones of paris sapristi all is clear as spider webs your cousin madeleine robin roxanne well but so much the better tell her so she saw your triumph here this very night look well at me then tell me with what hope this vile protuberance can inspire my heart i do not lull me with illusions yet at times i'm weak in evening hours dim i enter some fair pleasance perfume sweet with my poor ugly devil of a nose i scent spring's essence in the silver rays i see some knight a lady on his arm and think to saunter thus neath the moonshine i were fain to have my lady too beside thought soars to ecstasy oh sudden fall the shadow of my profile on the wall my friend my friend at times tis hard tis bitter to feel my loneliness my own ill favour taking his hand you weep no never think how vilely suited adown this nose a tear its passage tracing i never will while of myself i'm master let the divinity of tears their beauty be wedded to such common ugly grossness nothing more solemn than a tear sublimer and i would not 
by weeping turn to laughter the grave emotion that the tear engenders. Never be sad. What's love? A chance of fortune. Shaking his head. Look I a Caesar to woo Cleopatra? A Tito to aspire to Berenice? Your courage and your wit. The little maid who offered you refreshment even now. Her eyes did not abhor you. You saw well. Impressed. True. Well, how then? I saw Roxanne herself was death pale as she watched the duel. Pale? Her heart, her fancy are already caught. Put it to the touch. That she may mock my face, that is the one thing on this earth I fear. Introducing someone to Serrano. Sir, someone asks for you. Seeing the duena. God, her duena. Scene 6. Serrano, Libre, the duena. The duena with the low bow. I was bid ask you where a certain lady could see her valiant cousin, but in secret. Overwhelmed. See me? Curtsying. Ay, sir. She has somewhat to tell. Somewhat? Still curtsying. Ay, private matters. Staggering. Ah, my God! Tomorrow, at the early blush of dawn, we go to hear Mass at St. Roch. Leaning against Libre. My God! After, what place for a few minutes' speech? Confused. Where? Ah, but, ah, my God! Say! I reflect. Where? At the pastry house of Raguano. Where lodges he? The Rue God Saint Honore. Going. Good. Be you there at seven? Without fail. The duena goes out. Scene seven. Serrano, Libre, then actors, actresses, Cuije, Brezaye, Linier, the porter, the violinists. Falling into Libre's arms. A rendezvous from her. You're sad no more. Ah, let the world go burn. She knows I live. Now you be calm, I hope. Beside himself for joy. Calm? I now calm? I'll be frenetic, frantic, raving mad. Oh, for an army to attack, a host. I've ten hearts in my breast, a score of arms, no dwarfs to cleave in twain. No giants now! For a few moments, the shadows of the actors have been moving on the stage. Whispers are heard. The rehearsal is beginning. The violinists are in their places. Hello there! Silence! We rehearse! <laughs> we go! He moves away. By the big door enter Kije, Brizaye, and some officers holding up Linie, who is drunk. Serrano. Well, what now? A lusty thrush they're bringing you. Recognizing him. Lanier, what has chanced? He seeks you. He dare not go home. Why not? Showing him a crumpled letter. This letter warns me that a hundred men. Revenge that threatens me. That song, you know, at the port de Nesle. To get to my own house, I must pass there. I dare not. Give me leave to sleep tonight beneath your roof. Allow. A hundred men? You'll sleep in your own bed. But... In a terrible voice, showing him the lighted lantern held by the porter, who is listening curiously. Take the lantern. Linnea seizes it. Let us start. I swear that I will make your bed tonight myself. To the officers. Follow. Some stay behind as witnesses. A hundred? Less, tonight, would be too few. The actors and actresses in their costumes have come down from the stage and are listening. But why embroil yourself? Libre who scolds. That worthless drunkard. Slapping Linier on the shoulder. Wherefore? For this cause, this wine barrel, this cask of burgundy, did on a day an action full of grace. As he was leaving church, he saw his love take holy water. He, who is afeard at water's taste, ran quickly to the stoop and drank it all to the last drop. Indeed, that was a graceful thing. Aye, was it not? First actress to the others. But why a hundred men against one poor rhymer? March. To the officers. Gentlemen, when you shall see me charge, bear me no succor. None, whate'er the odds. Second actress, jumping from the stage. Oh, I shall come and see. Come then. Third actress, jumping down to an old actor. And you? 
Come all, the doctor, Isabel, Leander, come, for you shall add in a motley swarm the farce Italian to this Spanish drama. Dancing for joy. Bravo. A mantle. Quick. My hood. Come on. Play us a march, gentlemen of the band. The violinists join the procession which is forming. They take the footlights and divide them for torches. Brave officers. Next, women in costume and twenty paces on. He takes his place. I, all alone, beneath the plume that glory lends, herself to deck my beaver, proud as Scipio. You hear me? I forbid you succor me. One, two, three. Porter, open wide the doors. The porter opens the doors. A view of old Paris in the moonlight is seen. Ah, Paris, wrapped in night, half nebulous, the moonlight streams o'er the blue shadowed roofs. A lovely frame for this wild battle scene. Beneath the vapors floating scarves, the same trembles mysterious like a magic mirror. And shortly you shall see what you shall see. To the, to the Port de Nail. Nail. Standing on the threshold. I, to the Port de Nail. Turning to the actress. Did you not ask, young lady, for what cause against this rhymer five score men were sent? He draws his sword. Was that they knew him for a friend of mine. He goes out. Linie staggers first after him, then the actresses on the officer's arms, the actors. The procession starts to the sound of the violence and in the faint light of the candles. Act 2 The Poet's Eating House Raganus Cook and Pastry Shop A large kitchen at the corner of the Rue Saint-Hanor and the Rue de la Arbresec, which are seen in the background through the glass door, in the grey dawn. On the left, in the foreground, a counter surmounted by a stand in forged iron, on which are hung geese, ducks, and water peacocks. In great china vases are tall bouquets of simple flowers, principally yellow sunflowers. On the same side, further back, an immense open fireplace, in front of which, between monster fire dogs, on each of which hangs a little saucepan. The roasts are dripping into the pans. On the right, foreground with door, further back, staircase, leading to a little room under the roof, the entrance of which is visible through the open shutter. In this room, a table is laid. A small Flemish luster is alight. It is a place for eating and drinking. A wooden gallery, continuing the staircase, apparently leads to other similar little rooms. In the middle of the shop, an iron hoop is suspended from the ceiling by a string with which it can be drawn up and down. A big king is hung around it. The ovens in the darkness under the stairs give forth a red glow. The copper pans shine. The spits are turning. Heaps of woods formed into pyramids. Hands suspended. It is the busy hour of the morning. Bustle and hurry of scullions, fat cooks and diminutive apprentices, their caps profusely decorated with cock's feathers and wings of guinea fowl. On metal and wicker plates, they bring in piles of cakes and tarts. Tables laden with rolls and dishes of food. Other tables, surrounded with chairs, are ready for the consumers. A small table in a corner, covered with papers, at which Raganu is seated writing on the rising of the curtain. Scene 1. Raganu, pastry cooks, then Lisa. Raganu is writing with an inspired air at a small table and counting on his fingers. First pastry cook bringing an elaborate fancy dish. Fruits in nougat. Second pastry cook bringing another dish. Custard. Third pastry cook bringing a roast decorated with feathers. Peacock. Fourth pastry cook bringing a batch of cakes on a slab. Rissoles. Fifth pastry cook bringing a sort of pie dish. Beef jelly. Raganu ceasing to write and raising his head. Aurora silver rays begin to glint e'en now on the copper pans. And thou, O Ragno, must perforce stifle in thy breast the god of song. Anon shall come the hour of the lute. Now tis the hour of the oven. He rises to a cook. You, make that sauce longer, tis too short. How much too short? Three feet. He passes on farther. What means he? 
showing a dish to Raganu, the tart, the pie, before the fire. My muse, retire, lest thy bright eyes be reddened by the faggot's blaze. To a cook, showing him some loaves. You have put the cleft of the loaves in the wrong place. Know you not that the caesura should be between the hemistitches? To another, showing him an unfinished pastry. To this palace of paste you must add the roof. To a young apprentice, who, seated on the ground, is spitting the fowls. And you, as you put on your lengthy spit the modest fowl and the superb turkey, my son, alternate them, as the old malherb loved well to alternate his long lines of verse with the short ones. Thus shall your roasts in strophes turn before the flame. The apparentus, also coming up with a tree covered by a napkin. Master, I bethought me erewhile of your tastes, and made this, which will please you, I hope. He uncovers the tree, and shows a large lyre made of pastry. A lyre! Tis of brioche pastry. With conserved fruits. The strings, see, are of sugar. Giving him a coin. Go, drink my health. Seeing Liz enter. Hush! my wife bustle pass on and hide that money to liz showing her the lyre with a conscious look is it not beautiful tis passing silly she puts a pile of papers on the counter bags good i thank you he looks at them heavens my cherished leaves the poems of my friends torn dismembered to make bags for holding biscuits and cakes ah tis the old tale again orpheus and the bacantes and am I not free to turn at last to some use the sole thing that your wretched scribblers of halting lines leave behind them by way of payment? Groveling aunt, insult not the divine grasshoppers, the sweet singers. Before you were the sworn comrade of all that crew, my friend, you did not call your wife aunt in bacchant. To turn fair verse to such a use. Faith, tis all it's good for. Pray then, madam, to what use would you degrade prose? Scene two. The same. Two children who have just trotted into the shop. What would you, little ones? Three pies. Serving them. See, hot and well browned. If it please you, sir, will you rub them up for us? Aside. Alas, one of my bags. To the children. What? Must I wrap them up? He takes a bag, and just as he is about to put in the pies, he reads. Ulysses thus on leaving fair Penelope. Not that one. He puts it aside, and takes another, and as he is about to put in the pies, he reads. The gold-locked Phoebus. Nay, nor that one. Same play. What are you dallying for? Here, here, here. He chooses a third. The sonnet to Phyllis, but tis hard to part with it. By good luck he has made up his mind at last. Shrugging her shoulders. Nicodemus. She mounts on a chair and begins to range plates on a dresser. Taking advantage of the moment she turns her back, calls back the children, who are already at the door. S children, render me back the sonnet to Phyllis, and you shall have six pies instead of three. The children give him back the bag, seize the cakes quickly, and go out. Smoothing out the paper, begins to declaim. Phyllis... On that sweet name, a smear of butter. Phyllis. Cyrano enters hurriedly. Scene three. Raganu, Liz, Cyrano, then the musketeer. What's o'clock? Bowing low. Six o'clock. With emotion. In one hour's time. He paces up and down the shop, following him. Bravo, I saw. Well, what saw you then? Your combat. Which? That in the Burgundy Hotel, Faith. Ah, the duel. Ay, the duel in verse. He can talk of naught else. Well, good, let be. Making passes with a spit that he catches up. At the envoy's end I touch, at the envoy's end I touch, tis fine, fine. At the envoy's end. What hour is it now, Raguno? Stopping short in the act of thrusting to look at the clock. Five minutes after six. I touch. He straightens himself. Oh, to write a ballad. To Cyrano, who, as he passes by the counter, has absently shaken hands with her. What's wrong with your hand? Not a slight cut. Have you been in some danger? None in the world. Shaking her finger at him. Methinks you speak not the truth in saying that. Did you see my nose quiver when I spoke? Faith, it must have been a monstrous lie that should move it. Changing his tone. I wait someone here. Leave us alone, and disturb us for naught, and it were not for the crack of doom. 
But tis impossible. My poets are coming. Oh, aye, for their first meal of the day. Prithee, take them aside when I shall make you sign to do so. What's o'clock? Ten minutes after six. Nervously seating himself at Ragano's table and drawing some paper toward him. A pen. Giving him the one from behind his ear. Here, a swan's quill. The musketeer with the fierce moustache enters and in a stentorian voice. Good day. Liz goes up to him quickly, turning round. Who's that? Tis a friend of my wife, a terrible warrior, at least so says he himself. Taking up the pen and motioning Raganu away. Hush. To himself. I will write, fold it, give it her, and fly. Throws down the pen. Coward! But strike me dead if I dare to speak to her. I even one single word. To Raganu. What time is it? A quarter after six. Striking his breast. I, a single word of all those here. Here, but writing, tis easier done. He takes up the pen. Go to, I will write it, that love letter. Oh, I have writ it and rewrit it in my own mind so oft that it lies there ready for pen and ink. And if I lay but my soul by my letter sheet, tis not to do but to copy from it. He writes, scene four. Raganu leaves the musketeer, Cyrano at the little table writing, the poets dressed in black, their stockings ungartered and covered with mud. Here they come, your mud bespattered friends. First poet entering to Raganu, brother in arts. Second poet to Raganu, shaking his hands, dear brother, hey soaring eagle among pastry cooks. Matter, it smells good here in your airy. Tis at Phoebus's own rays that thy roasts turn. Apollo among master cooks. Whom they surround and embrace. Ah, oh, how quick a man feels at his ease with them. We were stayed by the mob. They are crowded all around the port in ale. Eight bleeding brigand carcasses strew the pavements there, all slit open with sword gashes. Cyrano? Raising his head a minute. Eight? Hold. Me thought seven. He goes on writing. To Cyrano. Know you who might be the hero of the fray? Carelessly. Not I. To the musketeer. And you? Know you? Purling his moustache. Maybe. Writing a little way off, he's heard murmuring a word from time to time. I love thee. "'Twas one man, say they all, I swear to it, one man who single-handed put the whole band to the rout. "'Twas a strange sight, pikes and cudgels strewed thick upon the ground. "'Writing. "'Thine eyes. "'And they were picking up hats all the way to Key d'Orfelva. "'Sabaristi! But he must have been a ferocious. "'Same play. "'Thy lips.' "'Twas a powerless, fearsome giant that was the author of such exploits. "'Same play. "'And when I see thee come, I faint for fear. "'Felching a cake. "'What has rhymed of late, Argano? "'Same play. "'Who worships thee?' "'He stops, just as he is about to sign, and gets up, slipping the letter into his doublet. "'No need I sign, since I give it her myself.' "'To second poet. "'I have put a recipe into verse.' Seating himself by a plate of cream puffs. Go to, let us hear these verses. Looking at a cake which he has taken. Its cap is all on one side. He makes one bite of the top. See how this gingerbread woos the famous rhymer with its almond eyes and its eyebrows of Angelica. He takes it. We listen. Squeezing a cream puff gently. How it laughs till its very cream runs over. Biting a bit of the great liar of pastry. This is the first time in my life that ever I drew any means of nourishing me from the liar. Who has put himself ready for reciting, cleared his throat, settled his cap, struck an attitude. <clears throat> a recipe in verse. To first poet, nudging him. You are breakfasting? To second. And you dining, methinks. How almond tartlets are made. Beat your eggs up light and quick, froth them thick, 
Mingle with them while you beat Juice of lemon, essence fine, Then combine the burst milk of almonds sweet. Circle with a custard paste The slim waist of your tartlet moulds, The top with a skilful fingerprint. Nick and dint round their edge, Then, drop by drop, In its little dainty bed Your cream shed. In the oven place each mould Reappearing softly brown, the renowned almond tartlets you behold. With mouths crammed full. Exquisite. Delicious. Choking. <clears throat> they go up eating. Who has been watching goes to a dragonoon. Lulled by your voice, did you see how they were stuffing themselves? In a low voice, smiling. Oh, I, I see well enough. But I never will seem to look, fearing to distress them. Thus I gain a double pleasure when I recite to them my poems, for I leave those poor fellows who have not breakfasted free to eat, even while I gratify my own dearest foible. See you? Clapping him on the shoulder. Friend, I would like you right well. Ragano goes after his friends. Cyrano follows him with his eyes, then rather sharply. Who there? Lise. Lise, who is talking tenderly to the musketeer, starts and comes down towards Cyrano. So this fine captain is laying siege to you? Offended. One haughty glance of my eye can conquer any man that should dare venture aught against my virtue. Who conquering eyes, methinks, are oft conquered eyes. Choking with anger. But incisively. I like Raguno well, and so mark me. Dame Lise, I permit not that he be rendered a laughing stock by any but who has raised his voice so as to be heard by the gallant. A word to the wise. He bows to the musketeer and goes to the doorway to watch after looking at the clock. To the musketeer who has merely bowed in answer to Cyrano's bow. How now? Is this your courage? Why turn you not a jest on his nose? On his nose. Aye, aye. His nose. He goes quickly farther away. Lise follows him. From the doorway, signing to Raganu to draw the poets away. Hist! Showing them the door on the right. We shall be more private there. Impatiently. Hist! Hist! Drawing them further. To read poetry, tis better here. Despairingly, with his mouth full. What? Leave the cakes? Never! Let's take them with us. They all follow Raganu in procession after sweeping all the cakes of the trays. Scene 5. Cyrano, Roxa, the Duena. Ah, if I see but the faint glimmer of hope, then I draw out my letter. Roxa, masked, followed by the Duena, appears at the glass pane of the door. He opens quickly. Enter. Walking up to the Duena. Two words with you, Duena. Four, sir, an it like you. Are you fond of sweet things? I, I could eat myself sick on them. Catching up some paper bags from the counter. Good. See you these two sonnets of Monsieur Buzerade. Hey. Which I fill for you with cream cakes. Changing her expression. Ha. What say you to the cake they call a little puff? If made with cream, sir, I love them passing well. Here I plunge six for your eating into the bosom of a poem by saint Amand, and in these verses of Chapelain I glide a lighter morsel. Stay, love you hot cakes? Ay, to the core of my heart. Filling her arms with the backs? Pleasure me, then. Go eat them all in the street. But... Pushing her out, and come not back till the very last crumb be eaten. He shuts the door, comes down toward Roxanne, and uncovering, stands at a respectful distance from her. Scene 6. Cyrano, Roxanne. Blessed be the moment when you condescend, remembering that humbly I exist, to come to meet me, and to say, to tell? Roxanne, who has unmasked, to thank you, first of all, that dandy count whom you checkmated in brave sword-play last night. He's the man whom a great lord, desirous of my favour, Ah, de Guiche, casting down her eyes, sought to impose on me for husband. Aye, husband, 
dupe husband. Husband a la mode. Bowing. Then I fought. Happy chance, sweet lady, not for my ill favor, but for your favor's fair. Confession next. But ere I make my shrift, you must be once again that brother friend with whom I used to play by the lakeside. Aye, you would come each spring to Bergerac. Mind you the reeds you cut to make your swords. Well, you wove corn straw plates for your doll's hair. Those were the days of games. And blackberries. In those days you did everything I bid. Roxanne, in her short frock, was Madeleine. Was I fair, then? You were not ill to see. Oft times, with hands all bloody from a fall, you'd run to me. Then, aping mother ways, I in a voice would be severe, would chide. She takes his hand. What is this scratch again that I see here? She starts, surprised. Oh! Tis too much. What's this? Cyrano tries to draw away his hand. No, let me see. At your age, fie. Where did you get that scratch? I got it playing at the Porte de Nail. Seating herself by the table and dipping her handkerchief in a glass of water. Give here. Sitting by her. So soft, so gay, maternal sweet. And tell me, while I wipe away the blood, how many against you? Oh, a hundred, near. Come, tell me. No, let be. But you, come tell the thing just now you dared not. Keeping his hand. Now I dare. The scent of those old days emboldens me. Yes, now I dare. Listen. I am in love. Ah. But with one who knows not. Ah. Not yet. Ah. But who, if he knows not, soon shall learn. Ah. A poor youth, who all this time has loved timidly from afar, and dares not speak. Ah. Leave your hand. Why, it is fever hot. But I have seen love trembling on his lips. Ah. Bandaging his hand with her handkerchief. And to think of it, that he by chance, yes, cousin, he is of your regiment. Ah. Uh? Is cadet in your own company. Ah. Uh? On his brow he bears the genius stamp. He is proud, noble, young, intrepid, fair. Rising suddenly, very pale. Fair. Why, what ails you? Nothing. Tis. He shows his hand, smiling. This scratch. I love him. All is said. But you must know I have only seen him at the comedy. How? You have never spoken? Eyes can speak. How know you then that he... Oh, people talk neath the limes in the Place Royale. Gossip's chat has let me know. He is cadet? In the guards. His name? Baron Christian de Nevelet. How now? He is not of the guards. Today he is to join your ranks under Captain Carbon de Castel Jaloux. Ah, how quick, how quick the heart has flown. But my poor child. The duena opening the door. The cakes are eaten, Monsieur Bergerac. Then read the verses printed on the bags. She goes out. My poor child, you who love but flowing words, bright wit, what if he be... But a lout unskilled. No, his bright locks like Durfe's heroes. Ah, a well-curled pate and witless tongue, perchance. Ah, no, I guess, I feel, his words are fair. All words are fair that lurk neath fair moustache. Suppose he were a fool. Stamping her foot. Then bury me. After a pause. Was it to tell me this? You brought me here. I fail to see what use this serves, madame. Nay, but I felt a terror here in the heart. On learning yesterday, you were Gascons, all of your company. And we provoke all beardless sprigs that favor dares admit, midst as pure Gascons. Pure, heaven save the mark. They told you that as well? Ah, think how I trembled for him. Between his teeth. Not causelessly. 
But when last night I saw you brave, invincible, punish that dandy, fearless, hold your own against those brutes, I thought, I thought if he whom all fear, all, if he would only... Good. I will befriend your little baron. Ah, you'll promise me you will do this for me. I've always held you as a tender friend. Aye, aye. Then you will be his friend. I swear. And he shall fight no duels. Promise. None. You are kind, cousin. Now I must be gone. She puts on her mask and deal quickly, then absently. You have not told me of your last night's fray. Ah, but it must have been a hero fight. Bid him to write. She sends him a kiss with her fingers. How good you are. Aye, aye. A hundred men against you. Now farewell. We are great friends. Aye, aye. Oh, bid him write. You'll tell me all one day. A hundred men. Ah, brave. How brave. Bowing to her. I have fought better since. She goes out. Cyrano stands motionless, with eyes on the ground. A silence. The door right opens. Raganu looks in. Scene 7. Cyrano, Raganu, Poets, Carbon du Castel Jaloux, the Cadets, a crowd, then de Guiche. Can we come in? Without stirring. Yes. Raganu signs to his friends and they come in. At the same time, by door at back, enters Carbon de Castel Jaloux in captain's uniform. He makes gestures of surprise on seeing Cyrano. Here he is. Raising his head. Captain. Our hero. We heard all. Thirty or more of my cadets are there. Shrinking back. But? Trying to draw him away. Come with me. They will not rest until they see you. No. They're drinking opposite, at the bear's head. I... Going to the door and calling across the street in a voice of thunder. He won't come. The hero's in the sulks. First cadet outside. Ah, son dear. Tumult outside. Noise of boots and swords is heard approaching, rubbing his hands. They are running across the street. Entering. Mildieu. Captidius. Pocadidius. Raganu, drawing back startled. Gentlemen, are you all from Gascony? All. Oh. Second cadet to Cyrano. Bravo. Baron. First Gascon, shaking his hands. Vivat. Baron. Come, I must embrace you. We'll embrace him all in turn. Not knowing whom to reply to. Baron, Baron, I beg. Are you all Baron, sirs? Aye, everyone. everyone. Is it true? Aye, why, you could build a tower with nothing but our coronets, my friend. Lebre, entering and running up to Cyrano. They're looking for you. Here's a crazy mob led by the men who followed you last night. What? Have you told them where to find me? Rubbing his hands. Yes. The burgher, entering, followed by a group of men. Sir, all the marais is a coming here. Outside, the street is filled with people. Chases are porters and carriages have drawn up. In a low voice, smiling to Cyrano. And Roxanne? Quickly. Hush. Calling outside. Cyrano! A crowd rush into the shop, pushing one another. Acclamations. Standing on a table. Lo, my shop invaded. They break all. Magnificent. My, my friend, friend! My friend! My friend! friend. My friend. Me seems that yesterday I had not all these friends. Delighted. Success. First Marquis, hurrying up with his hands held out. My friend, didst thou but know? Thou, Mary, thou. Pray, when did we herd swine together, you and I? I would present you, sir, to some fair dames who in my carriage yonder. Coldly. Ah. And who will first present you, sir, to me? What's wrong? Hush. Gazetteer with writing board. A few details? No. Nudging his elbows. Tis Theophrast Renaudet of the Court Gazette. Who cares? This paper. But it is of great importance. They say it will be an immense success. Advancing. Sir? What, another? Pray permit, I make a pentacrostic on your name. Also advancing. Pray, sir. Enough, enough. 
A moment in the crowd, De Guiche appears, escorted by officers Kuiji, Brezaye, the officers who went with Cyrano the night before. Kuiji comes rapidly up to Cyrano. Here is Monsieur De Guiche. A murmur, everyone makes way. He comes from the Marche de Gassion. Bowing to Cyrano. Who would express his admiration, sir, for your new exploit noised so loud abroad. Bravo! Bravo! Bowing. The Marshal is a judge of valor. He could not have believed the thing unless these gentlemen had sworn they witnessed it. With our own eyes. Aside to Cyrano, who has an absent air. But you. Hush. But you suffer. Starting. Before this rabble, I. He draws himself up, twills his moustache, and throws back his shoulders. Wait. You shall see. To whom Quije has spoken in a low voice. In feats of arms, already your career abounded. You serve with those crazy pates of Gascons? I with the cadets. With us. Looking at the cadets, ranged behind Cyrano. Ah, oh, all these gentlemen of haughty mien. Are they the famous? Cyrano? Ay, Captain. Since all my companies assembled here, pray favor me. Present them to my lord. Making two steps toward de Guiche. My lord de Guiche, permit that I present. Pointing to the cadets. The bold cadets of Gascony, of Carbon, of Castel Jaloux. Drawling and swaggering boastfully, the bold cadets of Gascony. Spouting of armory, heraldry, their veins a brimming with blood so blue. The bold cadets of Gascony, of Carbon, of Castel Jaloux. Eagle Eye and Spindle Shanks, fierce mustache and wolfish tooth. Slash the rabble and scatter their ranks. Eagle Eye and Spindle Shanks, with a flaming feather that gaily pranks. Hiding the holes in their hats for sooth. Eagle Eye and Spindle Shanks, fierce mustache and wolfish tooth. Pink your doublet. And slit your trunk, are their gentlest sobriquets. With fame and glory, their soul is drunk. Pink your doublet, and slit your trunk. In brawl and skirmish, they show their spunk. Give rendezvous, and broil and fray. Pink your doublet, and slit your trunk, are their gentlest sobriquets. What? Ho! Cadets of Gascony, all jealous lovers are sport for you. O oh, woman! Dear divinity, what ho, cadets of Gascony, whom scowling husbands quake to see? Blow, tartara, and cry, cuckoo, what ho, cadets of Gascony, husbands and lovers are game for you. Seated with a haughty carelessness in an armchair brought quickly by Raganu. A poet, tis the fashion of the hour. Will you be mine? No, sir, no man's. Last night your fancy pleased my uncle Richelieu. I'll gladly say a word to him for you. Great heavens! I imagine you have rhymed five acts or so. In Serrano's ear. Your play, your Agrippine. You see it staged at last. Take them to him. Beginning to be tempted and attracted. In sooth, I would. He is a critic skilled. He may correct a line or two, at most. Whose face stiffens at once. Impossible! My blood congeals to think that other hand should change a comma's dot. But when a verse approves itself to him, he pays it dear, good friend. He pays less dear than I myself. When a verse pleases me, I pay myself and sing it to myself. You are proud. Really? You have noticed that? Second cadet entering with a string of old battered plumed beaver hats full of holes slung on a sword. See, Cyrano, this morning on the quay what strange bright feathered game we caught. The hats of the fugitives. Spolia opima. <laughs> <laughs> he who laid that ambush faith must curse and swear. Who was it? I myself. The laughter stops. I charge them. Work too dirty for my sword. 
to punish and chastise a rhymester's sot constrained silence in a low voice to cyrano showing him the beavers what to do with them they're full of grease a stew taking the sword and with a salute dropping the hats at de guiche's feet sir pray be good enough to render them back to your friends rising sharply my chair there quick i go to cyrano passionately as to you sirra brisaye in the street portus for my lord de guiche who has controlled himself smiling have you read don quixote i have and doff my hat at the mad knight errant's name i counsel you to study appearing at back my lord's chair the windmill chapter bowing chapter the 13th for when one tilts gainst windmills it may chance tilt i gainst those who change with every breeze that the windmill sails may sweep you with their arm down in the mire or upward to the stars de guiche goes out and mounts into his chair the other lords go away whispering together lebre goes to the door with them the crowd disperses scene eight cyrano lebre the cadets who are eating and drinking at tables left and right bowing mockingly to those who go out without daring to salute him gentlemen gentlemen coming back despairingly here's a fine coil oh scold away at least you will agree that to annihilate each chance of fate exaggerates yes i exaggerate triumphantly ah but for principle example too i think tis well thus to exaggerate oh lay aside that pride of musketeer fortune and glory wait you ay and then seek a protector choose a patron out and like the crawling ivy round a tree that licks the bark to gain the trunk's support climb high by creeping roots instead of force no gramercy what i like all the rest dedicate verse to bankers play buffoon in cringing hope to see at last a smile not disapproving on a patron's lips gramercy no what learn to swallow toads with frame a weary climbing stairs a skin grown grimed and horny here about the knees and acrobat like teach my back to bend no gramercy or double faced and sly run with the hare while hunting with the hounds and oily tongued to win the oil of praise flatter the great man to his very nose no gramercy steal soft from lap to lap a little great man in a circle small or navigate with madrigals for sails blown gently windward by the old lady's sighs no gramercy bribe kindly editors to spread abroad my verses gramercy or try to be elected as the pope of tavern councils held by imbeciles no gramercy toil to gain reputation by one small sonnet instead of making many no gramercy or flatter sorry bunglers be terrorized by every prating paper say ceaselessly oh had i but the chance of a fair notice in the mercury gramercy no grow pale fear calculate prefer to make a visit to a rhyme seek introductions draw petitions up no gramercy and no and no again but sing dream laugh co lightly solitary free with eyes that look straight forward fearless voice to cock your beaver just the way you choose or yes or no show fight or turn a rhyme to work without one thought of gain or fame to realize that journey to the moon never to pen a line that has not sprung straight from the heart within embracing then modesty say to oneself good my friend be thou content with flowers 
fruit, nay, leaves, but pluck them from no garden but thine own. And then, if glory come by chance your way, to pay no tribute unto Caesar, none. But keep the merit all your own, in short, disdaining tendrils of the parasite, to be content if neither oak nor elm, not to mount high perchance, but mount alone. Alone, and if you will, but not with hand against every man. How in the devil's name have you conceived this lunatic idea, to make foes for yourself at every turn? By dint of seeing you at every turn make friends, and fawn upon your frequent friends, with mouth wide smiling, slit from ear to ear, I pass, still unsaluted, joyfully, and cry, What, ho, oh, another enemy? Lunacy! Well, what if it be my vice, my pleasure to displease, to love men hate me? Ah, friend of mine, believe me, I march better neath the crossfire of glances inimical. How droll the stains one sees on fine-laced doublets, from gall of envy, where the poltroons drivel. The enervating friendship which enfolds you is like an open-laced Italian collar floating around your neck in woman's fashion. One is at ease thus, but less proud the carriage. The forehead, free from mainstay or coercion, bends here, there, everywhere, but I, embracing hatred, she lends, forbidding stiffly fluted, the rough's starched folds that hold the head so rigid, each enemy another fold, a gopher who adds a constraint and adds a ray of glory, for hatred, like the ruff worn by the Spanish, grips like a vice, but frames you like a halo. After a silence, taking his arm, Speak proud, aloud, and bitter. In my ear whisper me simply this, She loves thee not. Hush! Christian has just entered, and mingled with the cadets, who do not speak to him. He has seated himself at a table, where Lise serves him. Scene 9 Cyrano, Libre, the cadets, Christian the Neuvelet. Third cadet, seated at a table, glass in hand. Cyrano! Cyrano turns round. The story! In its time! He goes up on Libre's arm. They talk in low voices, rising and coming down. The story of the fray! Twill lessen well. He stops before the table where Christian is seated. This timid young apprentice. Raising his head. Prentice? Who? This sickly northern greenhorn. Sickly. Hark, Monsieur de Neville. This in your ear. There's somewhat here one no more dares to name than to say rope to one whose sire was hanged. What may that be? See here. He puts his finger three times, mysteriously, on his nose. Do you understand? Oh, tis the... Hush, oh, never breathe that word, unless you'd reckon with him yonder. He points to Cyrano, who is talking with Libre. Second Gascon, who has meanwhile come up noiselessly to sit on the table, whispering behind him. Hark, he put two snuffling men to death in rage, for the sole reason they spoke through their nose darting on all fours from under the table where he had crept. And if you would not perish in the flower of youth, oh, mention not the fatal cartilage. Clapping him on the shoulder. A word, a gesture, for the indiscreet. His handkerchief may prove his winding sheet. Silence. All, with crossed arms, look at Christian. He rises and goes over to Carbon de Casteljaloux, who is talking to an officer and feigns to see nothing. Captain! Turning and looking at him from head to foot. Sir! Pray, what skills it best to do to southerners who swagger? Give them proof that one may be a northerner, yet brave. He turns his back on him. I thank you. To Cyrano. Now, the tale. The, the tale. tale! Coming toward them. The tale! All bring their stools up and group round him, listening eagerly. Christian is astride a chair. Well... I went all alone to meet the band. The moon was shining, clock-like, full in the sky, when suddenly some careful clock-right passed a cloud of cotton wool across the case.
that held the silver watch. And presto, hi, the night was inky black, and all the keys were hidden in the murky dark. Gadzooks! One could see nothing further. Than one's nose. Silence. All slowly rise, looking in terror at Cyrano, who has stopped, dumbfounded. Pass. Who on God's earth is that? It is a man who joined today. Making a step toward Christian. Today? Yes. His name is the Baron de Neville. Checking himself. Good. It is well. He turns pale, flushes, makes as if to fall on Christian. I... He controls himself. What said I? For the burst of rage. Mordius! Then continues calmly. That it was dark. Astonishment. The cadets reseat themselves, staring at him. On I went thinking. For a knavish cause, I may provoke some great man, some great prince, who certainly could break. My nose! Everyone starts up. Christian balances on his chair. In a choked voice. My teeth! Who would break my teeth, and I, imprudent-like, was poking. My nose. My finger. In the crack, between the tree and bark, he may prove strong and wrap me. Over the nose. Wiping his forehead. Over the knuckles. I, but I cried, forward, Gascon, duty calls. On, Cyrano. And thus I ventured on, when from the shadow came. A crack of the nose. I parry it, find myself... Nose to nose. Bounding onto him. Heaven and earth. All the Gascons leap up to see, but when he is close to Christian, he controls himself and continues. <sighs> With a hundred brawling sots who stank. A noseful. White, but smiling. Onions, brandy cups. I leapt out, head well down. Nosing the winds. I charge. Gore too. Impale one, run him through. One aims at me, puff, and I parry. Puff! Bursting out. Great God, out, all of you. The cadets rush to the doors. The tiger awakes. Every man, out. Leave me alone with him. We shall find him minced fine, minced into hash and a big pasty. I am turning pale and curl up like a napkin, limp and white. Let us be gone. He will not leave a crumb. I die of fright to think what will pass here. Shutting door right. Something too horrible. All have gone out by different doors, some by the staircase. Cyrano and Christian are face to face, looking at each other for a moment. Scene 10. Embrace me now. Sir? You are brave. No, oh, but... Nay, I insist. Pray, tell me. Come, embrace. I am her brother. Whose brother? Hers, if faith. Roxanne's. Rushing up to him. Oh, heavens, her brother. Cousin, brother, the same thing. And she has told you? All. She loves me, say. Maybe. Taking his hands. How glad I am to meet you, sir. That may be called a sudden sentiment. I ask your pardon. Looking at him with his hand on his shoulder. True. He's fair, the villain. Ah, sir. If you but knew my admiration... But all those noses. Oh, I take them back. Roxanne expects a letter. Woe's a day. How? I am lost if I but ope my lips. Why so? I am a fool. Could die for shame. None is a fool who knows himself a fool. And you did not attack me like a fool. Bah. One finds battle cry to lead the assault. I have a certain military wit. But before women, I can but hold my tongue. Their eyes... True, when I pass, their eyes are kind. And when you stay, their hearts, methinks, are kinder? No, for I am one of those men, tongue-tied, I know, uh, who can never tell their love. And I, meseems, had nature been more kind, more careful, when she fashioned me, had been one of those men who well could speak their love. Oh, to express one's thoughts with facile grace. To be a musketeer. With handsome face. Roxanne is precious. I'm sure to prove a disappointment to her. Looking at him. Had I but such an interpreter to speak my soul. Eloquence. Where to find it? That I lend, if you lend me your handsome victor charms. 
splendid. We make a hero of romance. How so? Think you you can repeat what things I daily teach your tongue? What do you mean? Roxanne shall never have a disillusion. Say, wilt thou that we woo her double-handed? Wilt thou that we two woo her both together? Feelst thou, passing from my leather doublet through thy laced doublet, all my soul inspiring? But, Serrano... Will you, I say? I fear. Since, by yourself, you fear to chill her heart, will you, to kindle all her heart to flame, wed into one my phrases and your lips? Your eyes flash. Will you? Will it please you so, give you such pleasure? Madly. It. Then calmly, business-like. It would amuse me. It is an enterprise to tempt a poet. Will you complete me, and let me complete you? You march victorious, I go in your shadow. Let me be wit for you. Be you my beauty. The letter that she waits for even now, I never can. Taking out the letter he had written. See, here it is, your letter. What? Take it. Look, it wants but the address. But I... Fear nothing. Send it. It will suit. But have you... Oh... We have our pockets full, we poets of love letters, writ to Chloe's, Daphne's, creations of our noddle heads, our lady loves, phantasms of our brains, dream fancies blown into soap bubbles. Come, take it, and change feigned love words into true. I breathe my sighs and moans haphazard wise. Call all these wandering lovebirds home to nest. You'll see that I was in these lettered lines, eloquent all the more the less sincere. Take it and make an end. Were it not well to change some words, written haphazard-wise, will it fit Roxanne? Twill fit like a glove. But... O oh, credulity of love, Roxanne will think each word inspired by herself. My friends! He throws himself into Serrano's arms. They remind us. Scene 11 Cyrano, Christian, the Gascons, the Musketeer, Lise. First Gascon, half opening the door. Not here, the silence of the grave, I dare not look. He puts his head in. Why? Entering, and seeing Cyrano and Christian embracing. Oh, oh, this passes all. Consternation. The Musketeer, mockingly. Ho, oh, oh. ho, our demon has become a saint? Struck on one nostril, lo, he turns the other. Then we may speak about his nose henceforth. Calling to Liz boastfully. Ah, uh, Liz, see here. Sniffing ostentatiously. Oh, heavens, what a stink. Going up to Serrano. You, sir, without a doubt, have sniffed it up. What is the smell I notice here? Cuffing his head. Clove heads. General delight. The cadets have found the old Serrano again. They turn somersaults. Curtain. End of Act 3. Roxanne's Kiss A small square in the old Marais. Old houses. A perspective of little streets. On the right, Roxanne's house. And the wall of her garden, overhung with thick foliage. Window and balcony over the door. A bench in front. From the bench and the stones jutting out of the wall, it is easy to climb to the balcony, in front of an old house in the same style of brick and stone. The knocker of this door is bandaged with linen, like a sore thumb. At the rising of the curtain, the duena is seated on the bench. The window on Roxanne's balcony is wide open. Raganu is standing near the door in a sort of livery. He has just finished relating something to the duena and is wiping his eyes. Scene 1. Raganu, the Duena, then Roxanne, Cyrano, and two pages. And then off she went with a musketeer. Deserted and ruined too, I would make an end of all, and so hanged myself. My last breath was drawn. Then in comes Monsieur de Bergerac. He cuts me down and begs his cousin to take me for her steward. Well, but how came it about that you were thus ruined? Oh, Lise loved the warriors. And I loved the poets. What cakes there were that Apollo chanced to leave were quickly snapped up by Mars. Thus ruin was not long a-coming. Rising and calling up to the open window. Roxanne, are you ready? 
They wait for us. Roxanne's voice from the window. I will but put me on a cloak. To Raganu, showing him the door opposite. They wait us there opposite at Clomere's house. She receives them all there today, the précieuses, the poets. They read a discourse on the tender passion. The tender passion? Ay, indeed. Calling up to the window. Roxanne, and you come not down quickly, we shall miss the discourse on the tender passion. I come, I come. A sound of stringed instruments approaching. Cyrano's voice behind the scenes singing. La, 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 la. They serenade us. Followed by two pages with arch lutes. I tell you, they are demi semi quavers, demi semi fool. Ironically, you know then, sir, to distinguish between semi quavers and demi semi quavers. Is not every disciple of Gassendi a musician? Playing and singing. La la. Snatching the lute from him and going on with the phrase. In proof of which I can continue. La 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 la. Appearing on the balcony. What? Tis you? Going on with the air and singing to it. Tis I who come to serenade your lilies and pay my devoir to your roses. I am coming down. She leaves the balcony, pointing to the pages. How come these two virtuosi here? Tis for a wager I won of Desucci. We were disputing a nice point in grammar. Contradictions raised hotly. Tis so. No, tis so. When suddenly he shows me these two long shanks, whom he takes about with him as an escort, and who are skillful in scratching lute strings with their skinny claws. I will wager you a day's music, says he, and lost it. Thus see you till Phoebus's chariot starts once again. These lute twangers are at my heels, seeing all I do, hearing all I say, and accompanying. All with melody. Twas pleasant at first, but the faith I begin to weary of it already. To the musicians. Ho oh, there! Go serenade Montfleury for me. Play a dance to him. The pages go toward the door. To the duenna. I have come, as is my wont, nightly, to ask Roxanne whether. To the pages who are going out. Play a long time and play out of tune. To the duena. Whether her soul's elected is ever the same, ever faultless. Coming out of the house. Ah, how handsome he is, how brilliant a wit, and how well I love him. Smiling. Christian has so brilliant a wit. Brighter than even your own, cousin. Be it so with all my heart. Ah, methinks twere impossible that there could breathe a man on this earth skilled to say as sweetly as he all the pretty nothings that mean so much, that mean all. At times his mind seems far away, the muse says not, and then presto he speaks bewitchingly, enchantingly. Incredulously. No, no. Fie, that is ill said. But lo, men are ever thus. Because he is fair to see, you would have it that he must be dull of speech. He hath an eloquent tongue in telling his love? In telling his love? Why, tis not simple telling, tis dissertation, tis analysis. How is he with the pen? Still better. Listen, here. Reciting. The more of my poor heart you take, the larger grows my heart. Triumphantly to Cyrano. How like you those lines? And thus it goes on. And, since some target I must show for Cupid's cruel dart, Oh, if mine own you deign to keep, then give me your sweetheart. Lord, first he has too much, then anon not enough. How much heart does the fellow want? You would vex a saint, but tis your jealousy. Starting. What mean you? I, your poet's jealousy. Hark now, if this again be not tender sweet. My heart to yours sounds but one cry. If kisses fast could flee by letter, then with your sweet lips my letters red should be. If kisses could be writ with ink, if kisses fast could flee. Smiling approvingly in spite of himself. Ha! Those last lines are, hmm, hmm. 
correcting himself contemptuously. They are paltry enough. And this? Enchanted. Then you have his letters by heart? Every one of them. By all oaths that can be sworn, tis flattering. They are the lines of a master. Modestly. Come, nay, a master. Aye, I say it, a master. Good, be it so. The duena, coming down quickly. Here comes Monsieur de Guiche. To Cyrano, pushing him toward the house. In with you. Twere best he see you not. It might perchance put him on the scent. To Cyrano. I of my own dear secret. He loves me and is powerful, and if he knew, then all were lost. Mary, he could well deal a death blow to my love. Entering the house. Good, good. De Guiche appears. Scene two. Roxanne, de Guiche, the duena standing a little way off. Good seeing to de Guiche. I was going out. I come to take my leave. Whither go you? To the war. Ah. I, tonight. Oh. I am ordered away. We are to besiege Arras. Ah. To besiege? I, my going moves you not, meseems. Nay. I am grieved to the core of the heart. Shall I again behold you? When? I know not. Heard you that I am named commander? Indifferently. Bravo. Of the guards, regiment. Startled. What? The guards? Aye. Where serves your cousin? The swaggering boaster. I will find a way to revenge myself on him at Arras. Choking. What mean you? The guards go to Arras? Bethink you. Is it not my own regiment? Falling seated on the bench. Aside. Christian! What ails you? Oh, I am in despair. The man one loves at the war. Surprised and delighted. You say such sweet words to me? Tis the first time, and just when I must quit you. Collected and fanning herself. Thus, you would fain revenge your grudge against my cousin? My fair lady is on his side? Nay, against him. Do you see him often? But very rarely. He is ever to be met now in company with one of the cadets, one new Vilain Villere. Of high stature? Fair-haired. Ay, a red-headed fellow. Handsome. Tut. But dull-witted. One would think so to look at him. Changing her tone. How mean you to play your revenge on Cyrano? Perchance you think to put him in the thick of the shots. Nay, believe me, that were a poor vengeance. He would love such a post better than aught else. I know the way to wound his pride far more keenly. What then? Tell. If, when the regiment marched to Arras, he were left here with his beloved boon companions, the cadets, to sit with crossed arms so long as the war lasted. There is your method, would you enrage a man of his kind. Cheat him of his chance of mortal danger, and you punish him right fiercely. Coming nearer? O oh, woman, woman, who but a woman had e'er devised so subtle a trick? See you not how he will eat out his heart while his friends gnaw their thick fists for that they are deprived of the battle? So are you best avenged. You love me, then, a little? She smiles. I would fain, seeing you thus espouse my cause, Roxanne, believe it a proof of love. Tis a proof of love. Showing some sealed papers. Here are the marching orders. They will be sent instantly to each company. Except... He detaches one. This one. Tis that of the cadets. He puts it in his pocket. This I keep. Laughing. Ha ha ha, Cyrano. His love of battle. So you can play tricks on people. You of all ladies. Sometimes. Coming close to her. Oh, how I love you. To distraction. Listen, tonight, true, I ought to start. But how leave you now that I feel your heart is touched? Hard by, in the Rue d'Orléans, is a convent founded by Father Athanasius, the syndic of the Capuchins. True that no layman may enter, but I can settle that with the good fathers. Their habit sleeves are wide enough to hide me in. Tis they who serve Richelieu's private chapel, and from respect to the uncle, 
fear the nephew all will deem me gone i will come to you masked give me leave to wait till to-morrow sweet lady fanciful but if this be rumoured your glory bah but the siege arras twill take its chance grant but permission no give me leave tenderly it were my duty to forbid you ah you must go aside christian stays here aloud i would have you heroic antoine o oh, heavenly word you love then him for whom i trembled in an ecstasy ah i go then he kisses her hand are you content yes my friend he goes out the duenna making behind his back a mocking courtesy yes my friend to the duenna not a word of what i have done cyrano would never pardon me for stealing his fighting from him she calls toward the house cousin scene three roxa the duenna cyrano we are going to clomere's house she points to the door opposite alcandra and lissimon are to discourse putting a little finger in her ear yes but my little finger tells me we shall miss them twere a pity to miss such apes they have come to clomire's door oh see the knocker is muffled up speaking to the knocker so they have gagged that metal tongue of yours little noisy one lest it should disturb the fine orators she lifts it carefully and knocks with precaution seeing that the door opens let us enter on the threshold to cyrano if christian comes as i feel sure he will bid him wait for me quickly as she is going in listen she turns what mean you to question him on as is your wont tonight oh eagerly well say but you will be mute mute as a fish i shall not question him at all but say give rein to your fancy prepare not your speeches but speak the thoughts as they come speak to me of love and speak splendidly smiling very good but secret secret not a word she enters and shuts the door when the door is shut bowing to her a thousand thanks the door opens again and roxa puts her head out lest he prepare himself the devil no no secret, secret. the door shuts calling christian scene four cyrano christian i know all that is needful here is occasion for you to deck yourself with glory come lose no time put away those sulky looks come to your house with me i'll teach you no why i will wait for roxanne here how crazy come quick with me and learn no no i say i am aweary of these borrowed letters borrowed love-makings thus to act a part and tremble all the time twas well enough at the beginning now i know she loves i fear no longer i will speak myself mercy and how know you i cannot speak i am not such a fool when all is said i've by your lessons profited you'll see i shall know how to speak alone the devil i know at least to clasp her in my arms seeing roxa come out from clomire's house it is she serrano no leave me not bowing speak for yourself my friend and take your chance he disappears behind the garden wall scene five christian roxa the duenna coming out of clomire's house with a company of friends whom she leaves bows and goodbyes patanoid alcandra gremion bitterly disappointed we've missed the speech upon the tender passion goes into roxanne's house still bowing a remadont adieu all bow to roxanne and to each other and then separate going up different streets roxanne suddenly seeing christian you she goes to him evening falls let's sit speak on i listen sits by her on the bench a silence oh i love you shutting her eyes i speak to me of love i love thee that's the theme but vary it i vary it i love you so oh without doubt and then and then i should be oh so glad so glad if you would love me roxanne tell me so with a little grimace i hoped for cream you give me gruel 
Say how love possesses you. Oh, utterly. Come, come. And not those tangled sentiments. Your throat, I'd kiss it. Christiana. I love thee. Half rising. Again? Eagerly detaining her. No, no, I love thee not. Reseating herself. Tis well. But I adore thee. Rising and going further off. Oh, I am grown stupid. And that displeases me almost as much as twould displease me if you grew ill-favoured. But... Rally your poor eloquence that's flown. I... Yes, you love me, that I know. Adieu. She goes toward her house. Oh, go not yet. I tell you. Opening the door. You adore me? I've heard it very oft. No, go away. But I would fain. She shuts the door in his face. Cyrano, who has re-entered unseen. If faith, it is successful. Scene 6. Christian, Cyrano, two pages. Come to my aid. Not I. But I shall die unless at once I win back her fair favour. And how can I at once, in the devil's name, lessen you in? Seizing his arm. Oh, she is there. The window of the balcony is now lighted up. Her window. Oh, I shall die. Speak lower. I shall die. The night is dark. Well. All can be repaired, although you merit not. Stand there, poor wretch. Fronting the balcony, I'll go beneath and prompt your words to you. But. Hold your tongue. First page, second page, reappearing at back to Cyrano. Oh. oh. Hush! He signs to them to speak softly, in a low voice. We played the serenade you bade to Montfleury. Go, lurk in ambush there, one at this street corner and one at that, and if a passerby should hear intrude, play you a tune. What tune, Sir Gassendist? Gay, if a woman comes, for a man, sad. The pages disappear, one at each street corner, to Christian. Call her. Roxanne! Picking up stones and throwing them at the window. Some pebbles. Wait a while. Half opening the casement. Who calls me? I. Who's that? Christian. Oh. You? I would speak with you. Under the balcony to Christian. Good. Speak soft and low. No. You speak stupidly. Oh, pity me. No. You love me no more. Prompted by Cyrano. You say, great heaven. I love no more when I love more and more. Roxa, who was about to shut the casement, pausing. Hold. Tis a trifle better. I a trifle. Simply. Love grew apace, rocked by the anxious beating of this poor heart, which the cruel wanton boy took for a cradle. Coming out onto the balcony. That is better. But, and if you deem that Cupid be so cruel, you should have stifled baby love in its cradle. Same play. Ah, madam, I essayed, but all in vain. This newborn babe is a young Hercules. Still better. Same play. Thus he strangled in my heart the serpent's twain of pride and doubt. Leaning over the balcony. Well said. But why so faltering? Has mental palsy seized on your faculty imaginative? Drawing Christian under the balcony and slipping into his place. Give place. This wax is critical. Today, your words are hesitating. Imitating Christian in a whisper. Night has come. In the dusk they grope their way to find your ear. But my words find no such impediment. They find their way at once. Small wonder that. For tis within my heart they find their home. Bethink how large my heart, how small your ear, And, from fair heights descending, words fall fast, But mine must mount, madam, and that takes time. Meseems that your last words have learned to climb. With practice such gymnastic grows less hard. In truth I seem to speak from distant heights. True, far above. At such a height, twere death, if a hard word from you fell on my heart. Moving. I will come down. No. Showing him the bench under the balcony. Mount then on the bench. Starting back alarmed. No. How? You will not. More and more moved. Stay a while. Tis sweet. 
the rare occasion when our hearts can speak ourselves unseen, unseeing. Why unseen? Ah, it is sweet, half hidden, half revealed. You see the dark folds of my shrouding cloak, and I, the glimmering whiteness of your dress. I, but a shadow, you, a radiance fair. Know you what such a moment holds for me? If ever I were eloquent. You were. Yet never, till tonight, my speech has sprung straight from my heart as now it springs. Why not? Till now I spoke haphazard. What? Your eyes have beams that turn men dizzy, but tonight methinks I shall find speech for the first time. Tis true, your voice rings with a tone that's new. Coming nearer? Aye, a new tone. In the tender, sheltering dusk I dare to be myself for once, at last. He stops, falters. What say I? I know not. Oh, pardon me, it thrills me, tis so sweet, so novel. How? So novel? Off his balance, trying to find the thread of his sentence. I, to be at last sincere, till now my chilled heart, fearing to be mocked. Mocked? And for what? For its mad beating. I, my heart has clothed itself with witty words, to shroud itself from curious eyes, impelled at times to aim at a star. I stay my hand, and, fearing ridicule, cull a wild flower. A wild flower sweet. Ay, but tonight, the star. Oh, never have you spoken thus before. If, leaving Cupid's arrows, quivers, torches, we turn to seek for sweeter, fresher things, instead of sipping in a pygmy glass dull, fashionable waters, did we try how the soul slakes its thirst in fearless drought, by drinking from the river's flooding brim. But wit! If I have used it to arrest you, at the first starting, now it would be an outrage, an insult, to the perfumed night, to nature, to speak fine words that garnish vain love letters. Look up, but at her stars. The quiet heaven will ease our hearts of all things artificial. I fear lest amidst the alchemy we're skilled in, the truth of sentiment dissolve and vanish. The soul exhausted by these empty pastimes, the gain of fine things, be the loss of all things. But wit, I say. In love, tis crime, tis hateful, turning frank loving into subtle fencing. At last the moment comes, inevitable. Oh, woe for those who never knows at the moment. When feeling love exists in us, ennobling each well-weighed word is futile and soul-saddening. Well, if that moment's come for us, suppose it. What words would serve you? All, 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 whatever that came to me, e'en as they came, I'd fling them in a wild cluster, not a careful bouquet. I love thee, I'm mad, I love, I stifle. Thy name is in my heart as in a sheep bell, and as I ever tremble thinking of thee. Ever the bell shakes, ever thy name ringeth. All things of thine I mind, for I love all things. I know that last year, on the twelfth of May month, to walk abroad, one day you changed your hair plates. I am so used to take your hair for daylight, that, like as when the eye stares on the sun's disk, one sees, long after, a red blot on all things. So... When I quit thy beams, my dazzled vision sees upon all things a blonde stain imprinted. Why, this is love indeed. Ay, true, the feeling which fills me, terrible and jealous, truly love, which is ever sad amid its transports. Love, and yet strangely, not a selfish passion. I, for your joy, would gladly lay mine own down. E'en though you never were to know it, never, if but at times I might, far off and lonely, hear some gay echo of the joy I bought you, each glance of thine awakes in me a virtue, a novel, 
unknown valor dost begin sweet to understand so late dost understand me feel'st thou my soul here through the darkness mounting too fair the night too fair too fair the moment that i should speak thus and that you should hearken too fair in moments when my hopes rose proudest i never hoped such guerdon naught is left me but to die now have words of mine the power to make you tremble throned there in the branches i like a leaf among the leaves you tremble you tremble for i feel and if you will it or will it not your hands beloved trembling thrill through the branches down your sprays of jasmine he kisses passionately one of the hanging tendrils i i am trembling weeping i am thine thou hast conquered all of me then let death come tis i tis i myself who conquered thee one thing but one i dare to ask under the balcony a kiss drawing back what oh you ask i to christian whispering fool you go too quick since she is thus moved i will profit by it to roxa my words sprang thoughtlessly but now i see shame on me i was too presumptuous a little chill how quickly you withdraw yes i withdraw without withdrawing hurt i modesty if so the kiss i asked oh grant it not to cyrano pulling him by his cloak why silence christian hush leaning over what whisper you i chid myself for my too bold advances said silence christian the lutes begin to play hark wait a while steps come roxan shuts the window cyrano listens to the lutes one of which plays a merry the other a melancholy tune why they play sad then gay then sad what neither man nor woman oh a monk enter a capuchin friar with a lantern he goes from house to house looking at every door scene seven cyrano christian a capuchin friar to the friar what do you playing at diogenes i seek the house of uh, madam oh plague take him madeline robin what would he pointing to a street at the back this way straight on I thank you and in your intention will tell my rosary to its last bead. He goes out. Good luck. My blessings rest upon your cowl. He goes back to Christian. Scene 8. Cyrano Christian. Oh, win for me that kiss. No. Soon or late. Tis true. The moment of intoxication, of madness, when your mouths are sure to meet. thanks to your fair mustache and her rose lips to himself i'd feener it should come thanks to a sound of shutters reopening christian goes in again under the balcony scene 9 cyrano christian roxa coming out on the balcony still there we spoke of a a kiss the word is sweet i see not why your lip should shrink from it if the word burns it what would the kiss do oh let it not your bashfulness affright have you not all this time insensibly left badinage aside and unalarmed glided from smile to sigh from sigh to weeping glide gently imperceptibly still onward from tear to kiss a moment's thrill a heart beat hush hush a kiss when all is said what is it an oath that's ratified a sealed promise a heart's avowal claiming confirmation a rose dot on the eye of adoration 
A secret that to mouth, not ear, is whispered. Brush of a bee's wing that makes time eternal. Communion perfumed like the spring's wild flowers. The heart's relieving and the heart's outbreathing. When to the lips the soul's flood rises brimming. Hush, hush. A kiss, madame, is honorable. The queen of France to a most favored lord did grant a kiss. The queen herself. What then? Speaking more warmly. Buckingham suffered dumbly, so have I. Adored his queen as loyally as I. Was sad but faithful, so am I. And you are fair as Buckingham. Aside, suddenly cooled. True, I forgot. Must I then bid thee mount to call this flower? Pushing Christian toward the balcony. Mount. This heart breathing. Mount. This brush of bee's wing. Mount. Hesitating. But I feel now as though twere ill done. This moment infinite. Still pushing him. Come, blockhead, mount. Christian springs forward and by means of the bench, the branches and the pillars, climbs to the balcony and strides over it. Ah, Roxanne. He takes her in his arms and bends over her lips. I, strange pain that wrings my heart, the kiss loves feast so near. I, Lazarus, lie at the gate in darkness, yet to me falls still a crumb or two from the rich man's board. I, tis my heart receives thee, Roxanne, mine. For on the lips you press, you kiss as well the words I spoke just now. My words. My words. The lutes play. A sad air. A gay air. The monk. He begins to run as if he came from a long way off and cries out. Hola. Who is it? I. I was but passing by. Is Christian there? Astonished. Serrano. Good day, cousin. Cousin. Good day. I'm coming. She disappears into the house. At the back, re-enter the friar. Seeing him. Back again. He follows Roxan. Scene 10. Cyrano, Christian, Roxan, the friar, Raganu. Tis here, I'm sure of it. Madame Madeline Robine. Why, you said Roland. No, not I. B I N Bean. Roxa, appearing on the threshold, followed by Raganu, who carries a lantern, and Christian. What is? A letter. What? To Roxa. Oh, it can boot but a holy business. Tis from a worthy lord. To Christian. De Guiche. He dares. Oh, he will not importune me forever. Unsealing the letter. I love you. Therefore. She reads in a low voice, by the aid of Raganus' lantern. Lady, the drums beat. My regiment buckles its harness on, and starts. But I, they deem me gone before. But I stay. I have dared to disobey your mandate. I'm here in convent walls. I come to you tonight. By this poor monk, a simple fool who knows not what he bears, I send this missive to apprise your ear. Your lips erewhile have smiled on me too sweet. I go not ere I've seen them once again. I would be private, send each soul away, receive alone him, whose great boldness you have deigned, I hope to pardon ere he asks, he who is ever your, etc. To the monk. Father, this is the matter of the letter. All come near her, and she reads aloud. Lady, the cardinal's wish is law, albeit it be to you unwelcome. For this cause I send these lines, to your fair ear addressed, by a holy man, discreet, intelligent. It is our will that you receive from him in your own house the marriage. She turns the page. Benediction. Straightway this night. Unknown to all the world, Christian becomes your husband. Him we send. He is abhorrent to your choice. Let be. 
Resign yourself, and this obedience will be, by heaven, well recompensed. Receive, fair lady, all assurance of respect from him who ever was and still remains. You are humble and obliged, etc. With great delight. O oh, worthy lord, I knew naught was to fear. It could be but holy business. To Christia, in a low voice. Am I not apt at reading letters? Hum. Aloud, with despair. But this is horrible. The friar, who has turned his lantern on Serrano. Tis you? Tis I. Turning the light on to him, and as if a doubt struck him on seeing his beauty. But quickly. I have overlooked the postscript. See, give twenty pistoles for the convent. Oh, most worthy lord. To Roxan. Submit you? With a martyr's look. I submit. While Ragnu opens the door, and Christian invites the friar to enter, she whispers to Cyrano. Oh, keep to Guiche at bay. He will be here. Let him not enter till... I understand. To the friar. What time need you to tie the marriage knot? A quarter of an hour. Pushing them all toward the house. Go. I stay. To Christian. Come. They enter. Now. How to detain de Guiche so long? He jumps on the bench, climbs to the balcony by the wall. Come, up I go. I have my plan. The lutes begin to play a very sad air. What? Ho! Oh. The tremolo grows more and more weird. It is a man. Aye, tis a man this time. He is on the balcony, pulls his hat over his eyes, takes off his sword, wraps himself in his cloak, then leans over. Tis not too high. He strides across the balcony, and drawing to him a long branch of one of the trees that are by the garden wall, he hangs on to it with both hands, ready to let himself fall. I'll shake this atmosphere. Scene 11. Cyrano de Guiche, who enters masked, feeling his way in the dark. What can that cursed friar be about? The devil! If he knows my voice! Letting go with one hand, he pretends to turn on an invisible key. Solemnly. Rick. Crack! Assume thou, Cyrano, to serve the turn, the accent of thy native Bejera. Looking at the house. Tis there. I see dim. This mask hinders me. He is about to enter when Cyrano leaps from the balcony, holding on to the branch, which bends, dropping him between the door and de Guiche. He pretends to fall heavily, as from a great height, and lies flat on the ground, motionless, as if stunned. De Guiche taps back. What's this? When he looks up, the branch has sprung back into its place. He sees only the sky and is lost in amazement. Where fell that man from? Sitting up and speaking with a Gascon accent. From the moon. From? In a dreamy voice. What o'clock? He's lost his mind for sure. What hour? What country is this? What month? What day? But? I am stupefied. Sir? Like a bomb? I fell from the moon. Impatiently. Come now. Rising in a terrible voice. I say, the moon. Recoiling. Good, good. Let it be so. He's raving mad. Walking up to him. I say from the moon. I mean no metaphor. But. Was a hundred years, a minute since. I cannot guess what time that fall embraced. That I was in that saffron colored ball. Shrugging his shoulders. Good, let me pass. Intercepting him. Where am I? Tell the truth. Fear not to tell. Oh, spare me not. Where, where have I fallen like a shooting star? More bleu. The fall was lightning quick. No time to choose. Where I should fall, I know not where it be. Oh, tell me, is it on a moon or earth that my posterior weight has landed me? I tell you, sir. With a screech of terror, which makes de Guiche start back. No! Can it be? I'm on a planet where men have black faces. Putting a hand to his face. What? Feigning great alarm. Am I in Africa? A native you? Who has remembered his mask. This mask of mine? Pretending to be reassured. In Venice? Ha! Ah, or Rome? Trying to pass? A lady waits. Quiet reassured. Oh ho! I am in Paris. Smiling in spite of himself. The fool is comical. You laugh. 
I laugh, but would get by. Beaming with joy, I have shot back to Perry. Quite at ease, laughing, dusting himself, bowing. Come, pardon me, by the last water spout covered with ether, accident of travel, my eyes still full of stardust and my spurs encumbered by the planet's filaments. Picking something off his sleeve. Ha, ah, on my double. Ah, a comet's hair. He puffs as if to blow it away, beside himself. Sir. Just as he is about to pass, holds out his leg as if to show him something and stops him. In my leg, the calf, there is a tooth of the great bear. And passing Neptune close, I would avoid his trident's point and fell, thus sitting plump right in the scales. My weight is marked, still registered up there in heaven. Hurriedly preventing Tigish from passing and detaining him by the button of his doublet. I swear to you, if you squeezed my nose, it would spout milk. Milk? From the Milky Way. Oh, go to hell. Crossing his arms. I fall, sir, out of heaven. Now, would you credit it that as I fell, I saw that Sirius wears a nightcap. True. Confidentially. The other bear is still too small to bite. Laughing. I went through the lira, but I snapped a cord. Grandiloquent. I mean to write the whole thing in a book. The small gold stars that wrapped up in my cloak, I carried safe away at no small risks, will serve for asterisks in the printed page. Come, make an end. I want. Oh ho, you are sly. Sir? You would worm all out of me, the way the moon is made, as if men breathe and live in its rotund cucurbita. Angrily. No, no, I want. Ha ha, to know how I got up. Hark, it was by a method all my own. Fearied. He's mad. Contemptuously. No, not for me the stupid eagle of Regio Montanus nor the timid pigeon of Architus, neither of those. Aye, tis a fool, but tis a learned fool. No imitator I of other men. Digish has succeeded in getting by and goes toward Roxanne's door. Cyrano follows him, ready to stop him by force. Six novel methods all this brain invented. Turning round. Six. Volubly. First. With body naked as your hand, festooned about with crystal flecons, full of the tears the early morning dew distills, my body to the sun's fierce rays exposed, to let it suck me up as to sucks the dew. Surprised, making one step towards Serrano. Ah, that makes one. Stepping back and enticing him further away. And then the second way. To generate wind for my impetus, to rarefy air in a cedar case by mirrors placed icosahedron wise. Making another step. Two. Still stepping backward. Or, or I have some mechanic skill to make a grasshopper with springs of steel and launch myself by quick succeeding fires, saltpeter fed. With the stars past years blue. Unconsciously following him and counting on his fingers. Three. Or since fumes have property to mount, to charge a globe with fumes sufficiently to carry me aloft. Same play, more and more astonished. Well, that makes four. Or smear myself with marrow from a bull, since at the lowest point of Zodiac, Phoebus well loves to suck that marrow up. Amazed. Five. Cyrano, who, while speaking, had drawn him to the other side of the square near a bench. Sitting on an iron platform, thence to throw a magnet in the air. This is a method well conceived. The magnet flown. Infallibly the iron will pursue. Then quick, relaunch your magnet, and you thus can mount and mount unmeasured distances. Here are six excellent expedients. 
Which of the six chose you? Why none? A seventh. Astonishing. What was it? I recount. This wild eccentric becomes interesting. Making a noise like the waves with weird gestures. Who? Who? Well? You have guessed. Not I. The tide. In the witching hour when the moon woos the wave, I laid me fresh from a sea bath on the shore, and failing not to put head foremost, for the hair holds the sea water in its mesh, I rose in air straight, straight, like angel's flight, and mounted, mounted gently, effortless, when lo, a sudden shock, then... Overcome by curiosity, sitting down on the bench. Then? Oh, then! Suddenly returning to his natural voice. The court is gone. I'll hinder you no more. The marriage vows are made. Springing up. What? Am I mad? That voice. The house door opens. Lackeys appear carrying lighted candelabra. Light. Cyrano gracefully uncovers. That nose. Cyrano. Bowing. Cyrano. While we were chatting, they have plighted troth. Who? He turns round. Tableau. Behind the lackeys appear Roxa and Christian, holding each other by the hand. The friar follows them, smiling. Ragano also holds a candlestick. The duena closes the rear, bewildered, having made a hasty toilet. Heavens! Scene 12 The same. Roxa, Christian, the friar, Ragano, lackeys, the duena. To Roxa. You. Recognizing Christian in amazement. He. Bowing with admiration to Roxa. Cunningly contrived. To Cyrano. My compliments, Sir Apparatus Maker. Your story would arrest at Peter's gate saints eager for their paradise. Note well the details. Faith, they'd make a stirring book. Bowing. I shall not fail to follow your advice. The friar, showing with satisfaction the two lovers to De Guiche. A handsome couple, son, made one by you. With a freezing look. Aye. To Roxa. Bid your bridegroom, madame, fond farewell. Why so? To Christian. Even now the regiment departs. Join it. It goes to battle. Without doubt. But the cadets go not. Oh, aye, they go. Drawing out the paper he had put in his pocket. Here is the order. To Christian. Baron, bear it. Quick. Throwing herself in Christian's arms. Christian. Sneeringly to Cyrano. The wedding night is far, methinks. Aside. He thinks to give me pain of death by this. To Roxon. Oh, once again, your lips. Come, come, enough. Still kissing Roxon. Tis hard to leave her. You know not. Trying to draw him away. I know. Sound of drums beating a march in the distance. The regiment starts. To Cyrano, holding back Christian, whom Cyrano is drawing away. Oh, I trust him, you. Promise me that no risks shall put his life in danger. I will try my best, but promise that I cannot. But swear he shall be prudent. Again, I'll do my best, but... In the siege, let him not suffer. All that man can do, I... That he shall be faithful. Doubtless, but... That he will write oft. Pausing. That, I promise you. Curtain. End of Act 3. Act 4. The Carrots of Gascony. Post occupied by a company of Carbon de Casteljalou at the siege of Arras. In the background, an embankment across the whole stage. Beyond, view of plain extending to the horizon. The country covered with entrenchments. The walls of Arras and the outlines of its roofs against the sky in the distance. Tents, arms driven about, drums, etc. Day is breaking with a faint glimmer of yellow sunrise in the east. Sentinels at different points. Watch fires. The cadets of Gascony, wrapped in their mantles, are sleeping. Carbon de Casteljalou and Lebre are keeping watch. They are very pale and thin. Christian sleeps among the others in his cloak in the foreground, his face illuminated by the fire. 
సైలెన్స్ సీన్ వన్ క్రిస్టియా కార్బోన్ ద కెస్టల్ జలు లిబ్రే ద క్యాడెట్స్ దెన్ సిరానో టిస్ టెరిబుల్ నాట్ అ మోర్ సో లెఫ్ట్ మోర్ డ్యూ కార్బోన్ మేకింగ్ అ సైన్ దట్ ఈ షుడ్ స్పీక్ లోవర్ కర్స్ అండర్ యువర్ బ్రెత్ యు విల్ అవేక్ దెమ్ టు ద క్యాడెట్స్ హాష్ స్లీప్ ఆన్ టు లిబ్రే he who sleeps dines but that is sorry comfort for the sleepless what starvation firing is heard in the distance oh plague take their firing to awake my sons to the cadets who lift up their heads sleep on firing is again heard nearer this time second cadet moving the devil again tis nothing tis sereno coming back Those who have lifted up their heads prepare to sleep again. The sentinel from without. Ventrebieu, who goes there? Bergerac. Who is on the redoubt? Ventrebieu, who goes there? Appearing at the top. Bergerac, idiot. He comes down. Lebre advances anxiously to meet him. Heavens! Making signs that he should not awake the others. Hush! Wounded? Oh! You know it has become their custom to shoot at me every morning and to miss me. This passes all to take letters at each day's dawn to risk stopping before Christian. I promised he should write often. He looks at him. He sleeps. How pale he is, but how handsome still despite his sufferings. If his poor little lady love knew that he is dying of hunger. Get you quick to bed. Nay, never scold le bre. I ran but little risk. I have found me a spot to pass the Spanish lines where each night they lie drunk. You should try to bring us back provision. A man must carry no weight who would get by there, but there will be surprise for us this night. The French will eat or die if I mistake not. Oh, tell me. Nay, not yet. I am not certain. You will see. It is disgraceful that we should starve while we're besieging. Alas, how full of complication is this siege of Arras to think that while we are besieging we should ourselves be caught in a trap and besieged by the Cardinal Infante of Spain. It were well done if he should be besieged in his turn. I am in earnest. Oh, indeed. To think you risk a life so precious for the sake of a letter. Thankless one. seeing him turning to enter the tent where are you going i am going to write another he enters the tent and disappears scene 2 the same all but cyrano the day is breaking in a rosy light the town of arras is golden in the horizon the report of cannon is heard in the distance followed immediately by the beating of drums far away to the left other drums are heard much nearer sounds of stirring in the camp voices of officers in the distance the reveille the cadets move and stretch themselves nourishing sleep thou art at an end i know well what will be their first cry first gascon sitting up i am so hungry i am dying of hunger oh, oh. up with you cannot move a limb nor can i first cadet looking at himself in a bit of armor hmm. My tongue is yellow. The air at this season of the year is hard to digest. My coronet for a bit of chester. If none can furnish to my gaster wherewith to make a pint of chow, I shall retire to my tent like Achilles. Oh, something. Were it but a crust. Carbon going to the tent and calling softly. Cyrano, we, we are dying. dying. Continuing to speak under his breath. at the opening of the tent come to my aid you who have the art of quick retort and gay jest come hearten them up second cadet rushing toward another who is munching something what are you crunching there cannon wad soaked in axle grease tis poor hunting round about arras first gascon entering i have been after game second gascon following him and i after fish rushing to the two newcomers Well, what have you brought? A pheasant, a carp. Come show us quick. A good gin. A sparrow. Beside themselves. Tis more than can be borne. We, we will, will mutiny. mutiny. Cyrano, come to my help. 
The daylight has now come. Scene 3. The same. Cyrano. Appearing from the tent, very calm, with a pen stuck behind his ear and a book in his hand. What is wrong? Silence. To the first cadet. Why drag you your legs so sorrowfully? Ugh. I have something in my heels that weighs me down. And what may that be? My stomach. So have I, Faith. It must be in your way. Nay, I am all the taller. My stomach's hollow. Faith, twill make a fine drum to sound the assault. I have a ringing in my ears. No, no, tis false. A hungry stomach has no ears. Oh, to eat something. Something oily. Pulling off the cadet's helmet and holding it out to him. Behold your salad. What in God's name can we devour? Throwing him the book which he is carrying. The Iliad. The first minister in Paris has his four meals a day. Twere courteous and he sent you a few partridges. And why not? With wine, too. A little burgundy. Richelieu, s'il vous plaît. He could send it by one of his friars. I, by his eminence, Joseph himself. I am as ravenous as an ogre. Eat your patience, then. Shrugging his shoulders. Always. Your pointed word. I pointed words. I would fain die thus, some soft summer eve, making a pointed word for a good cause. To make a soldier's end by soldier's sword, wielded by some brave adversary, die on blood-stained turf, not on a fever bed, a point upon my lips, a point within my heart. I'm hungry. hungry. Crossing his arms. All your thoughts of meat and drink. Bertrand the Pfeiffer, you were a shepherd once. Draw from its double leathern case your fife. Play to these greedy, guzzling soldiers. Play old country airs with plaintive rhythm recurring, where lurk sweet echoes of the dear home voices, each note of which calls like a little sister. Those airs slow, slow ascending as the smoke wreaths rise from the hearthstones of our native hamlets. Their music strikes the ear like Gascon patois. The old man seats himself and gets his flute ready. Your flute was now a warrior in durance, but on its stem your fingers are dancing. A bird-like minuet. Oh, flute! Remember that flutes were made of reeds first, not labrinum. Make us a music, pastoral days recalling, the sole time of your youth in country pastures. The old man begins to play the airs of Languedoc. Hark to the music, Gascons. Tis no longer the piercing fife of camp, beneath his fingers the flute of the woods. No more the call to combat, tis now the love song of the wandering goat herds. Hark, tis the valley, the wet lands, the forest, the sunburnt shepherd boy with scarlet beret, the dusk of evening on the Dordogne River. Tis Gascony. Hark, Gascons, to the music. The cadets sit with bowed heads. Their eyes have a far-off look as if dreaming and they surreptitiously wipe away their tears with their cups and the corner of their cloaks to cyrano in a whisper but you make them weep ay for homesickness a nobler pain than hunger tis of the soul not of the body i am well pleased to see their pain change its viscera heartache is better than stomach ache but you weaken their courage by playing thus on their heartstrings making a sign to a drummer to approach not i the hero that sleeps in Gascon blood is ever ready to awaken them. T'would suffice. He makes a signal. The drum beats. Stand up and rush to take arms. What? What, what, is, what is, it? is it? Smiling. You see, one roll of the drum is enough. Goodbye dreams, regrets, native land, love, all that the pipe called forth the drum has chased away. Looking toward the back of the stage. Oh, here comes Monsieur de Gouche. Muttering. Ugh. 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 
smiling. A flattering welcome. We are sick to death of him. With his lace collar over his armor, playing the fine gentleman. As if one wore linen over steel. It were good for a bandage had he boils on his neck. Another plotting courtier. His uncle's own nephew. For all that, a Gascon. Aye, false Gascon, trust him not. Gascons should ever be crack-brained, not more dangerous than a rational Gascon. How pale he is! Oh, he is hungry, just like us poor devils, but under his cuirass, with its fine gilt nails, his stomach-ache glitters brave in the sun. Haridli, let us not seem to suffer either. Out with your cards, pipes, and dice. All begin spreading out the games on the drums, the stools, the ground, and on their cloaks, and light long pipes. And I shall read Descartes. He walks up and down, reading a little book, which he has drawn from his pocket. Table. Enter the guiche. All appear absorbed and happy. He is very pale. He goes up to Carbo. Scene 4. The same. De guiche. To Carbo. Good day. They examine each other. Aside, with satisfaction. He's green. Aside. He has nothing left but eyes. Looking at the cadets. Here are the rebels. I, sirs, on all sides I hear that in your ranks you scoff at me. That the cadets, these loutish, mountain-bred, poor country squires, and barons of Perigord, scarce find for me, their colonel, a disdain sufficient. Call me plotter, wily courtier. It does not please their mightiness to see a point-lace collar on my steel cuirass, and they enrage because a man, in sooth, may be no ragged robin, yet a Gascon. Silence. All smoke and play. Shall I command your captain punish you? No. I am free, moreover. Will not punish. Ah. I have paid my company. Tis mine. I bow but to headquarters. So, in faith, that will suffice. Addressing himself to the cadets. I can despise your taunts. Tis well known how I bear me in the war. At Bapalm yesterday, they saw the rage with which I beat back the Count of Bequa. Assembling my own men, I fell on his and charged three separate times. Without lifting his eyes from his book. And your white scarf? Surprised and gratified. You know that detail. Troth, it happened thus. While caracoling to recall the troops for the third charge, a band of fugitives bore me with them, close by the hostile ranks. I was in peril, capture, sudden death. When I thought of the good expedient to loosen and let fall the scarf which told my military rank, thus I contrived, without attention wait, to leave the foes and suddenly returning, reinforced with my own men, to scatter them. And now, what say you, sir? The cadets pretend not to be listening, but the cards and the dice boxes remain suspended in their hands, the smoke of their pipes in their cheeks. They wait. I say that Henri Quatre had not by any dangerous odds been forced to strip himself of his white helmet plume. Silent delight. The cards fall, the dice rattle, the smoke is puffed. The ruse succeeded, though. Same suspension of play, etc. Oh, maybe, but one does not lightly abdicate the honor to serve as target to the enemy. Cards, dice, fall again, and the cadets smoke with evident delight. Had I been present when your scarf fell low, our courage, sir, is of a different sort. I would have picked it up and put it on. Oh, I, another Gascon boast. A boast? Lend it to me, I pledge myself tonight, with it across my breast, to lead the assault. Another Gascon vaunt. You know the scarf lies with the enemy, upon the brink of the stream. The place is riddled now with shot. No one can fetch it hither. Drawing the scarf from his pocket and holding it out to him. Here it is. Silence. The cadets stifle their laughter in their cards and dice boxes. De Guiche turns and looks at them. They instantly become grave and set to play. 
one of them whistles indifferently the air just played by the fifer taking the scarf i thank you it will now enable me to make a signal that i had forborne to make till now he goes to the rampart climbs it and waves the scarf thrice what is that? that the sentinel from the top of the rampart see you yon man down there who runs descending tis a false spanish spy who is extremely useful to my ends the news he carries to the enemy are those i prompt him with so in a word we have an influence on their decisions scoundrel carelessly knotting on a scarf tis opportune what were we saying ah i have news for you last evening to victual us the marshal did attempt a final effort secretly he went to dorlen where the king's provisions be but to return to camp more easily he took with him a goodly force of troops those who attacked us now would have fine sport half of the armies absent from the camp ay if the spaniards knew twere ill for us but they know nothing of it oh they know they will attack us ah for my false spy came to warn me of their attack he said i can decide the point for their assault where would you have it i will tell them tis the least defended they'll attempt you there i answered good go out of camp but watch my signal choose the point from whence it comes to cadets make ready all rise sounds of swords and belts being buckled twill be in an hour good they all sit down again and take up their games to carbo time must be gained the marshal will return how gain it you will all be good enough to let yourselves to be killed vengeance oho i do not say that if i loved you well i had chosen you and yours but as things stand your courage yielding to no core the palm i serve my king and serve my grudge as well permit that i express my gratitude i know you love to fight against five score you will not now complain of paltry odds he goes up with carbo to the cadets we shall add to the gascon coat of arms with its six bars of blue and gold one more the blood red bar that was a missing there de guiche speaks in a low voice with carbo at the back orders are given preparations go forward cyrano goes up to cristian who stands with crossed arms putting his hand on cristian's shoulder cristian shaking his head roxanne alas at least i'd send my heart's farewell to her in a fair letter i had suspicion it would be today he draws a letter out of his doublet and had already writ show will you taking the letter i he opens and reads it hold what this is a spot taking the letter with an innocent look a spot a tear poets at last by dint of counterfeiting take counterfeit for true that is the charm this farewell letter it was passing sad i wept myself in writing it wept why oh death itself is hardly terrible but ne'er to see her more that is death's sting for i shall never christian looks at him we shall quickly i mean you snatching the letter from him give me that letter a rumor far off in the camp who goes there hello shots voices carriage bells what is it on the rampart tis a carriage all rush to see in the camp it enters it comes from the enemy fire no the coachman cries what does he say on the king's service everyone is on the rampart staring the bells come nearer the king's service how all descend and draw up in line uncover all the king's draw up in line let him describe his curve as it befits the carriage enters at full speed covered with dust and mud the curtains are drawn close two lackeys behind it is pulled up suddenly beat a salute a roll of drums 
the cadets uncover lower the carriage steps two cadets rush forward the door opens roxa jumping down from the carriage good day all are bowing to the ground but at the sound of a woman's voice every head is instantly raised scene 5 the same roxa on the king's service you i king loves what other king great god christia rushing forward why have you come this siege tis too long but why i will tell you all Cyrano, who at the sound of her voice has stood still, rooted to the ground, afraid to raise his eyes. My God, dare I look at her? You cannot remain here. But I say yes. Who will push a drum hither for me? She seats herself on the drum. They roll forward. So, I thank you. <laughs> My carriage was fired at by the patrol. Look, would you not think 'twas made of a pumpkin like Cinderella's chariot in the tale, and the footmen out of rats? Sending a kiss with her lips to Christian. Good morrow. Examining them all. You look not merry, any of you. Ah, know you that 'tis a long road to get to Arras? Seeing Cyrano. Cousin, delighted. Coming up to her. But how, in heaven's name? How found I the way to the army? It was simple enough, for I had but to pass on and on as far as I saw the country laid waste. Ah, what horrors were there! Had I not seen, then I could never have believed it. Well, gentlemen, if such be the service of your king, I would fainer serve mine. But 'tis sheer madness! Where in the fiend's name did you get through? Where? Through the Spanish lines. <laughs> for subtle craft, give me a woman. But how did you pass through their lines? Faith, that must have been a hard matter. None too hard. I but drove quietly forward in my carriage, and when some hidalgo of haughty mien would have stayed me, lo, I showed at the window my sweetest smile, and these signors, being with no disrespect to you, the most gallant gentlemen in the world, I passed on. True, that smile is a passport. But you must have been asked frequently to give an account of where you were going, madam. Yes, frequently. Then I would answer, "I go to see my lover." At that word, the very fiercest Spaniard of them all would gravely shut the carriage door and, with a gesture that a king might envy, make signal to his men to lower the muskets levelled at me. Then, with melancholy but with all very graceful dignity, his beaver held to the wind that the plumes might flutter bravely. He would bow low, saying to me, "Pass on, Signorita." But Roxanne, forgive me that I said my lover. But bethink you, had I said my husband, not one of them had let me pass. But what ails you? You must leave this place. I. And that instantly. No time to lose. Indeed, you must. But wherefore must I? Embarrassed. Tis that the same in three quarters of an hour, or for it were best. You might. You are going to fight. I stay here. No, 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 no. He is my husband. She throws herself into Christian's arms. They shall kill us both together. Why do you look at me thus? I will tell you why. In despair, tis a post of mortal danger. Turning round, mortal danger. Proof enough that he has put us here. To the geish. So, sir, you would have made a widow of me. Nay, on my oath. I will not go. I am reckless now, and I shall not stir from here. Besides, tis amusing. Oh ho! So our precieuse is a heroine. Monsieur de Bergerac, I am your cousin. We will defend you well. More and more excited. I have no fear of that, my friends. In ecstasy, the whole camp smells sweet of orris root. And by good luck, I have chosen a hat that will suit well with the battlefield. Looking at Digish, but were it not wisest that the count retire, they may begin the attack. That is not to be brooked. I go to inspect the cannon and shall return. You have still time. Think better of it. Never. Digish goes out. Scene six. The same, all but Digish, entreatingly. Roxanne, no. First cadet to the others. She stays. All hurrying, hustling each other, tidying themselves. A comb, soap. My uniform is torn. A needle, a ribbon. Lend your mirror. My cuffs, your curling iron. 
a razor. Roksa to Siranu, who still pleads with her. No, naught shall make me stir from this spot. Carbo, who like the others, has been buckling, dusting, brushing his hat, settling his plume, and drawing on his cuffs, advances to Roxa and ceremoniously. It is perchance more seemly, since things are thus, that I present to you some of these gentlemen who are about to have the honor of dying before your eyes. Roxa bows and stands leaning on Christian's arms, while Carbo introduces the cadets to her. Baron de Prorescus de Colvenac. With a low reverence, Madame, continuing, Baron de Castorac de Cohuzac, Vidame de Margaret Astrasic Lesba Arascarabiat, Chevalier de Tignac Zulet, Baron Hilot de Blagnac, Sarchan de Castel Cribulos. But how many names have you each? Scores. To Roxa, pray upon the hand that holds your kerchief. Opens her hand and the handkerchief falls. Why? The whole company start forward to pick it up, quickly raising it. My company had no flag, but now by my faith, they will have the fairest in all the camp. Smiling, tis somewhat small. Tying the handkerchief on the staff of his lance. But, tis of lace. First Gascon to the rest. I could die happy having seen so sweet a face. If I had something in my stomach, were it but a nut. Who has overheard? Shame on you! What? Talk of eating when a lovely woman? But your camp air is keen. I myself am famished. Pasties, cold fricassee, old wines. There is my bill of fare. Pray bring it all here. Consternation. All that? But where on earth find it? In my carriage. How? Now, serve up. Carve. Look a little closer at my coachman, gentlemen, and you will recognize a man most welcome. All the sauces can be sent to table hot if we will. Rushing Pelmel to the carriage. Tis Ragonneau! Acclamations. Oh, 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 oh. oh! Looking after them. Poor fellows. Kissing her hand. Kind fairy. Raganu standing on the box like a quack doctor at a fair. Gentlemen. General Delight. Bravo! 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 Bravo. The Spaniards gazing on a lady so dainty fair overlooked the fair so dainty. Applause. In a whisper to Christian. Hark! Christian. And occupied with gallantry perceived not. Is draws a plate from under the seat and holds it up. The Galantine. Applause. The Galantine passes from hand to hand, still whispering to Christian. Prithee, one word. And Venus so attracted their eyes that Diana could secretly pass by with. He holds up a shoulder of mutton. Her fawn. Enthusiasm. Twenty hands are held out to seize the shoulder of mutton. In a low whisper to Christian. I must speak to you. To the cadets who come down, their arms laden with foot. Put it all on the ground. She lays all out on the grass, aided by the two imperturbable lackeys who were behind the carriage. To Christian, just as Cyrano is drawing him apart. Come, make yourself of use. Christian comes to help her. Cyrano's uneasiness increases. Truffled peacock. Coming down, cutting a big slice of ham. By the mass, <laughs> we shall not brave the last hazard without having had a gullet full. Quickly correcting himself on seeing Roxa. Uh, pardon. A Balthazar feast. Throwing down the carriage cushions. The cushions are stuffed with ortolan. Hubbub. They tear open and turn out the contents of the cushions. Bursts of laughter. Merriment. Ah! Vidas! Throwing down to the cadets bottles of red wine. Flasks of rubies. And white wine. Flasks of topaz. Throwing a folded tablecloth at Cyrano's head. Unfold me that napkin. Come, come, be nimble. Waving a lantern. Each of the carriage lamps is a little larder. In a low voice to Christian as they arrange the cloth together. I must speak with you ere you speak to her. My whip handle is an aural sausage. Pouring out wine, helping. Since we are to die, let the rest of the army shift for itself. All for the Gascons. And Mark... If de Guiche comes, let no one invite him. Going from one to the other. There, there. You have time enough. Do not eat too fast. 
Drink a little. Why are you crying? <laughs> oh, it is all so good. Tut. Red or white? Some bread for Monsieur de Corbon? A knife. Pass your plate. A little of the crust? Some more? Let me help you. Some champagne? A wing? Cyrano, who follows her, his arms laden with dishes, helping her to wait on everybody. How I worship her. Going up to Christian. What will you? Nothing. Nay, nay, take this biscuit steeped in muscat. Come, but two drops. Trying to detain her. Oh, tell me why you came. Wait, my first duty is to these poor fellows. Hush, in a few minutes. Lebre, who had gone up to pass a loaf on the end of a lance to the sentry on the rampart. De Guiche. Quick, hide flasks, plates, pie dishes, game baskets. Hurry, let us all look unconscious. To Raganou. Up on your seat. Is everything covered up? In an instant, all has been pushed into the tents or hidden under doublets, cloaks, and beavers. De Guiche enters hurriedly, stops suddenly, sniffing the air. Silence. Scene 7. The same, de Guiche. It smells good here. Humming. Mm, low, low, low. Looking at him. What is the matter? You are very red. The matter? Nothing. Tis my blood boiling at the thought of the coming battle. Bum, ba bum, bum. Turning round. What's that? Slightly drunk. Nothing. Tis a song. A little. You are merry, my friend. The approach of danger is intoxicating. Calling Carbon de Casteljaloux to give him an order. Captain, I... He stops short on seeing him. Plague take me. But you look bravely too. Crimson in the face, hiding a bottle behind his back with an evasive movement. Oh! I have one cannon left and have had it carried there. He points behind the scenes. In that corner. Your men can use it in case of need. Reading slightly. Charming attention. With a gracious smile. Kind solicitude. How? They are all gone crazy? As you are not used to cannon, beware of the recoil. Pull. Furious. Going up to him. But. <laughs> Gascon cannons never recoil. Taking him by the arm and shaking him. You are tipsy, but what with? <laughs> with the smell of powder. Shrugging his shoulders and pushing him away, then going quickly to Roxa. Briefly, madame, what decision do you deign to take? I stay here. You must fly. No, I will stay. Since things are thus, give me a musket, one of you. Wherefore? Because I, too, mean to remain. At last, this is true valor, sir. Then you are Gascon, in spite of your lace collar. What is all this? I leave no woman in peril. Second cadet to the first. Hark you, think you not we might give him something to eat? All the viands reappear as if by magic, whose eyes sparkle. Vittles? Yes, you'll see them coming from under every coat. Controlling himself haughtily. Do you think I will eat your leavings? Saluting him. You make progress. I will fight without breaking my fast. With wild delight. Breaking. <laughs> he has got the accent. <laughs> Laughing. I. Tis a Gascon. All begin to dance. Carbon the Castelgelu, who had disappeared behind the rampart, reappearing on the ridge. I have drawn my pikemen up in line. They are a resolute troop. He points to a row of pikes, the tops of which are seen over the ridge, bowing to Roxa. Will you accept my hand and accompany me while I review them? She takes it and they go up toward the rampart, all uncover and follow them, going to Cyrano eagerly. Tell me quickly. As Roxa appears on the ridge, the tops of the lances disappear, lowered for the salute, and a shout is raised. She bows. Outside. Vivat! What is the secret? If Roxanne should... Should... Speak of the letters... Yes, I know. Do not spoil all by seeming surprised. At what? I must explain to you. Oh, tis no great matter. I but thought of it today on seeing her. You have... Tell quickly. You have written to her 
oftener than you think. How so? Thus, faith, I had taken it in hand to express your flame for you. At times I wrote without saying, I am writing. Ah. Tis simple enough. But how did you contrive, since we have been cut off thus, to... Oh, before dawn, I was able to get through. Folding his arms. That was simple too. And how oft, pray you, have I written? Twice in the week? Three times? Four? More often still. What, every day? Yes, every day. Twice. And that became so mad a joy for you that you braved death. Seeing Roxar returning. Hush, not before her. He goes hurriedly into his tent. Scene 8. Roxa, Christian. In the distance, cadets coming and going. Carbo and De Guiche give orders. Roxa running up to Christian. Ah, oh, Christian, at last. Taking her hands. Now tell me why. Why by these fearful paths so perilous? Across these ranks of ribald soldiery, you have come. Love, your letters brought me here. What say you? Tis your fault if I ran risks. Your letters turned my head. Ah, all this month. How many? And the last one ever bettered the one that went before. What? For a few inconsequent love letters? Hold your peace. Ah, you cannot conceive it. Ever since that night, when in a voice all new to me, under my window you revealed your soul. Ah, ever since I have adored you. Now your letters all this whole month long, me seemed as if I heard that voice so tender, true, sheltering, close. Thy fault, I say. It drew me, the voice of the night. Oh, wise Penelope would ne'er have stayed to broider on her hearthstone if her Ulysses could have writ such letters, but would have cast away her silken bobbins and fled to join him, mad for love as Helen. But I read, read again grew faint for love. I was thine, utterly. Each separate page was like a fluttering flower petal, loosed from your own soul, and wafted thus to mine. Imprinted in each burning word was love, sincere, all-powerful. A love sincere? Can that be felt, Roxanne? Aye, that it can. You come? O oh, Christian, my true lord, I come, were I to throw myself here at your knees, you would raise me, but tis my soul I lay at your feet, you can raise it never more. I come to crave your pardon, ay, tis time to sue for pardon, now that death may come, for the insult done to you when, frivolous, at first I loved you only for your face. Horror stricken. Roxanne! And later. Love less frivolous, like a bird that spreads its wings but cannot fly, arrested by your beauty, by your soul drawn close. I loved for both at once. And now? Ah, you yourself have triumphed o'er yourself. And now I love you only for your soul. Stepping backward. Roxanne! Be happy to be loved for beauty, a poor disguise the time so soon wears threadbare. Must be to noble souls, to souls aspiring, a torture. Your dear thoughts have now effaced that beauty that so won me at the outset. Now I see clearer, and I no more see it. Oh! You are doubtful of such victory. Roxanne! I see you cannot yet believe it. Such love? I do not ask such love as that. I would be loved more simply for... For that which they have all, in turns, loved in thee. Shame! Oh, be loved henceforth in a better way. No, the first love was best. Ah, how you err. Tis now that I love best, love well. Tis that which is thy true self, see, that I adore. Were your brilliance dimmed? Hush! I should love still. I, if your beauty should today depart. Say not so. I, I say it. Ugly, how? Ugly. I swear I'd love you still. My God. Are you content at last? In a choked voice. I... What is wrong? Gently pushing her away. Nothing. I have two words to say. One second. But... Pointing to the cadets. Those poor fellows, shortly doomed to death. My love deprives them of the sight of you. Go, speak to them. Smile on them ere they die.
deeply affected. Dear Christian, she goes up to the cadets who respectfully crowd round her. Scene nine. Christian, Cyrano, at back, rocks on talking to Carbon and some cadets, calling toward Cyrano's tent. Cyrano, reappearing fully armed. What? Why so pale? She does not love me. What? Tis you she loves. No. For she loves me only for my soul. Truly. Yes. Thus you see that soul is you. Therefore, tis you she loves, and you love her. I. Oh, I know it. I. Tis true. You love to madness. I and worse. Then tell her so. No. And why not? Look at my face. Be answered. She'd love me. Were I ugly. Said she so? Ay, in those words. I'm glad she told you that. But pooh, believe it not. I am well pleased she thought to tell you. Take it not for truth. Never grow ugly. She'd reproach me then. That I intend discovering. No, I beg. Ay, she shall choose between us. Tell her all. No, no, I will not have it. Spare me this. Because my face is happily fair, shall I destroy your happiness? Twit too unjust. And I, because by nature's freak I have the gift to say, all that perchance you feel, shall I be fatal to your happiness? Tell all. It is ill done to tempt me thus. Too long I've borne about within myself a rival to myself. I'll make an end. Christian. A union without witness, secret, clandestine, can be easily dissolved if we survive. My God, he still persists. I will be loved myself, or not at all. I'll go to see what they do there at the end of the post. Speak to her, and then let her choose one of us two. It will be you. Pray God. He calls. Roxanne. No, no. Coming up quickly. What? Serrano has things important for your ear. She hastens to Serrano. Christian goes out. Scene ten. Roxa. Cyrano, then Libre, Carbon de Casteljalu, the Cadets, Ragano, de Guiche, etc. Important? How? In despair, to Roxon. He's gone. Tis not. Oh, you know how he sees importance in a trifle. Warmly. Did he doubt of what I said? Ah, yes, I saw he doubted. Taking her hand. But are you sure you told him all the truth? Yes, I would love him were he. She hesitates. Does that word embarrass you before my face, Roxanne? I smiling sadly. Twill not hurt me. Say it. If he were ugly. Yes, ugly. Musket report outside. Hark! I hear a shot. Hideous. Hideous. Yes. Disfigured. I. Grotesque. He could not be grotesque to me. You'd love the same. The same. Nay, even more. Losing command over himself. Aside, my God, it's true. Perchance love waits me there. To Roxan, I, Roxanne, listen. Libre entering hurriedly to Cyrano. Cyrano, turning round. What? Hush. He whispers something to him, letting go Roxanne's hand and exclaiming, "Ah, God!" What is it? To himself, stunned. All is over now. Renewed reports. What is the matter? Hark! Another shot. She goes up to look outside. It is too late. Now I can never tell. Trying to rush out. What has chanced? Rushing to stop her. Nothing. Some cadets enter, trying to hide something they are carrying, and close round it to prevent Roxa approaching. And those men? Cyrano draws her away. What were you just about to say before? What was I saying? Nothing now. I swear. I swear that Christian's soul. His nature were hastily correcting himself. Nay, that they are the noblest, greatest. Were. Oh! She rushes up, pushing everyone aside. All is over now. Seeing Christian lying on the ground, wrapped in his cloak. Oh, Christian! To Cyrano. Struck by first shot of the enemy. Roxa flings herself down by Christian. Fresh reports of cannon, clash of arms, clamor, beating of drums. Carbo with sword in the air. Oh, come! Your muskets. Followed by the cadets, he passes to the other side of the ramparts. Christian. From the other side. Oh, make haste! Christian. Form line. Christian. 
Hand on your match! Ragnu rushes up, bringing water in a helmet. Christian in a dying voice. Roxanne! Cyrano quickly whispering into Christian's ear, while Roxanne distractedly tears a piece of linen from his breast, which she dips into the water, trying to stanch the bleeding. I told her all. She loves you still. Christian closes his eyes. Oh, my sweet love. Draw Ramrod! To Cyrano. He is not dead. Open your charges with your teeth. His cheek grows cold against my own. Ready! Present! Seeing a letter in Christian's doublet. A letter? Tis for me. She opens it. Aside. My letter. Fire! Musket reports. Shouts. Noise of battle. Trying to disengage his hand, which Roxanne on her knees is holding. But Roxanne, hark, they fight. Detaining him. Stay yet a while, for he is dead. You knew him, you alone. Oh, was not his a beauteous soul, a soul wondrous. Standing up, bad-headed. Aye, Roxanne. An inspired poet. Aye, Roxanne. And a mind sublime. Oh, yes. A heart too deep for common minds to plumb. A spirit subtle, charming. I, Roxanne. Flinging herself on the dead body. Dead, my love! Aside, drawing a sword. I, and let me die today, since all unconscious, she mourns me in him. Sounds of trumpets in the distance. Digish appearing on the ramparts, bareheaded, with a wound on his forehead in a voice of thunder. It is the signal. Trumpet flourishes. The French bring the provisions into camp. Hold but the place a while. See, there is blood upon the letter. Tears. A Spanish officer outside shouting, Surrender. No. Raganu, standing on the top of his carriage, watches the battle over the edge of the ramparts. The danger is ever greater. To Dugish, pointing to Roxa. I will charge. Take her away. Kissing the letter. Oh, God. His tears. His blood. Jumping down from the carriage and rushing toward her. She swooned away. On the rampart to the cadets with fury. Stand fast. Outside. Lay down your arms. No. no. To the geish. Now that you have proved your valor, sir. Pointing to Roxa. Fly and save her. Rushing to Roxa and carrying her away in his arms. So be it. Gain but time, the victory's ours. Good. Calling out to Roxa, whom the geish, aided by Raganu, is bearing away in a fainting condition. Farewell, Roxanne. Tumult, shouts, cadets reappear wounded, falling on the scene. Cyrano, rushing to the battle, is stopped by Carbon the Casteljadu, who is streaming with blood. We are breaking. I am wounded. Wounded twice. Shouting to the Gascons. Gascons! Ho, Gascons! Never turn your back. To Carbo, whom he is supporting. Have no fear. I have two deaths to avenge. My friend who's slain and my dead happiness. They come down, Cyrano, brandishing the lance to which is attached Roxanne's handkerchief. Float there, laced kerchief, broidered with her name. He sticks it in the ground and shouts to the cadets. Fall on them, Gascons, crush them! To the Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer, play! The Fife plays, the wounded try to rise. Some cadets, falling one over the other down the slope, group themselves round Cyrano and the little flag. The carriage is crowded with men inside and outside and, bristling with arquebuses, is turned into a fortress. First cadet, appearing on the crest, beaten backward but still fighting, cries, They're climbing the redoubt! and falls dead. <sighs> Let us salute them. The rampart is covered instantly by a formidable row of enemies. The standards of the imperialists are raised. Fire! General discharge. Fire! A deadly answering volley. The cadets fall on all sides. A Spanish officer uncovering. Who are these men who rush on death? Reciting. Eric amid a storm of bullets. The bold cadets of Gascony, of Carbon, of Castel Jaloux. Brawling, swaggering boastfully. He rushes forward, followed by a few survivors. The bold cadets. His voice is drawn. Act 5. Cyrano's Gazette.
fifteen years later in 1655, Park of the Sisters of the Holy Cross in Paris, magnificent trees, on the left the house, broad steps onto which open several doors, an enormous plane tree in the middle of the stage, standing alone. On the right, among big boxwood trees, a semicircular stone bench. The whole background of the stage is crossed by an alley of chestnut trees leading on the right hand to the door of a chapel seen through the branches. Through the double row of trees of this alley are seen lawns, other alleys, clusters of trees, winding of the park, the sky. The chapel opens by a little side door onto a colonnade which is breathed with autumn leaves and is lost to view a little farther on in the right hand foreground behind the boxwood. It is autumn. All the foliage is red against the fresh green of the lawns. The green boxwood and the yews stand out dark. Under each tree a patch of yellow leaves. The stage is strewn with dead leaves, which rustle underfoot in the alleys and half cover the steps and benches. Between the benches on the right hand and the tree a large embroidery frame, in front of which a little chair has been set. Baskets full of skeins and balls of wool, a tapestry begin. At the rising of the curtain, nuns are walking to and fro in the park. Some are seated on the bench around an older sister. The leaves are falling. Scene 1. Mother Marguerite, Sister Martha, Sister Claire, Other Sisters. Sister Martha to Mother Marguerite. Sister Claire glanced in the mirror once, nay, twice, to see if her coif suited. To Sister Claire. Tis not well. But I saw Sister Martha take a plum out of the tart. To Sister Martha. That was ill done, my sister. A little glance. And such a little plum. I shall tell this to Monsieur Cyrano. Nay, prithee, do not. He will mock. He'll say we nuns are vain. And greedy. Smiling. I and kind. Is it not true, pray, Mother Marguerite, that he has come each week on Saturday for ten years to the convent? Ay, and more. Ever since, fourteen years ago, the day his cousin brought here, midst our woollen quaffs, the worldly mourning of her widow's veil, like a blackbird's wing among the convent doves. He only has the skill to turn her mind from grief, and softened yet by time, and healed. He is so droll. It's cheerful when he comes. He teases us, but we all like him well. We make him pasties of Angelica. But he is not a faithful Catholic. We will convert him. Yes, yes. I forbid, my daughters, you attempt that subject. Nay, weary him not, he might less oft come here. But God— Nay, never fear, God knows him well. But every Saturday when he arrives, he tells me, Sister, I eat meat on Friday. Ah, oh, says he so? Well, the last time he came, food had not passed his lips for two whole days. Mother— He's poor. Who told you so, dear mother? Monsieur Le Bray. None help him. He permits not. In an alley at the back, Roxanne appears, dressed in black, with a widow's coif and veil. De Guiche, imposing looking and visibly aged, walks by her side. They saunter slowly. Mother Marguerite rises. Tis time we go in. Madame Madeleine walks in the garden with a visitor. To Sister Claire, in a low voice. The Marshal of Gramont. Looking at him. Tis he, I think. "'Tis many months now since he came to see her. "'He is so busy. "'The court. "'The camp. "'The world.' "'They go out. "'De Guiche and Roxa come forward in silence "'and stop close to the embroidery frame. "'Scene 2. "'Roxa, the Duke de Garmo, "'formerly Count de Guiche, "'then Le Bray and Ragano. "'And you stay here still, "'ever vainly fair, "'ever in weeds. "'Ever. "'Still faithful?' Still. After a pause. Am I forgiven? I, since I am here. Another pause. His was a soul, you say? Ah, when you knew him. Ah, maybe. I perchance too little knew him. And his last letter, ever next your heart? Hung from this chain, a gentle scapulary. And dead, you love him still? At times, meseems, he is but partly dead. Our hearts still speak, as if his love still living wrapped me round. After another pause, Cyrano comes to see you? Often, I. 
dear kind old friend. We call him my gazette. He never fails to come. Beneath this tree they place his chair, if it be fine. I wait. I broider. The clock strikes. At the last stroke I hear, for now I never turn to look, too sure to hear his cane tap down the steps. He seats himself. With gentle raillery he mocks my tapestry that's never done. He tells me all the gossip of the week. Libre appears on the steps. Why, here's Libre. Libre descends. How goes it with our friend? Ill, very ill. How? To the duke. He exaggerates. All oh, that I prophesied. Desertion, want. His letters now make him fresh enemies. Attacking the sham nobles, sham devout, sham brave, the thieving authors, all the world. Ah, but his sword still holds them all in check. None get the better of him. Shaking his head, time will show. Ah, but I fear for him, not man's attack. Solitude, hunger, cold December days, that wolf like steel into his chamber drear. Lo, the assassins that I fear for him. Each day he tightens by one hole his belt. That poor nose, tinted like old ivory. He has retained one shabby suit of serge. Ay, there is one who has no prize of fortune, yet is not to be pitied. With a bitter smile. My lord marshal. Pity him not. He has lived out his vows free in his thoughts as in his actions free in the same tone my lord true i have all and he has naught yet i were proud to take his hand bowing to roxa adieu i go with you the duke bows to libre and goes with roxa toward the steps pausing while she goes up ay true i envy him look you when life is brimful of success, though the past hold no action foul, one feels a thousand self-disgusts, of which the sum is not remorse, but a dim, vague unrest. And, as one mounts the steps of worldly fame, the Duke's furred mantles trail within their folds a sound of dead illusions, vain regrets, a rustle, scarce a whisper, like as when, mounting the terrace steps, by your morning robe, sweeps in its train the dying autumn leaves. You are pensive. True, I am. As he is going out, suddenly, Monsieur Le Bret, to Roxa, a word, with your permission. He goes to Le Bret, and in a low voice, True, that none dare to attack your friend but many hate him yesterday at the queen's card play twas said that cyrano may die by accident let him stay in be prudent raising his arms to heaven prudent he he's coming here i'll warn him but roxa who has stayed on the steps to a sister who comes toward her what is it reckon i would see you madame let him come to the duke and libre he comes to tell his troubles having been an author save the mark poor fellow now by turns he's singer bathing man then actor beadle wig maker teacher of the lute what will he be today by chance raganu entering hurriedly ah madame he sees libre ah you here sir smiling tell all your miseries to him i will return anon but madame Roxa goes out with the duke. Raganu goes towards Libre. Scene 3. Libre, Raganu. Since you are here, tis best she should not know. I was going to your friend just now, who was but a few steps from the house, when I saw him go out. I hurried to him, saw him turn the corner. Suddenly, from out a window where he was passing, was it chance? Maybe. A lackey let fall a large piece of wood. Cowards! Oh, Cyrano! I ran. I saw... Tis hideous. Saw our poet, sir, our friend, struck to the ground, a large wound in his head. 
He's dead? No, but I bore him to his room. Ah, his room! What a thing to see! That garret! He suffers? No, his consciousness has flown. So you a doctor? One was kind. He came. My poor Cyrano, we must not tell this to Roxanne suddenly. What said this leech? Said what I know not. Fever? Meningitis? Ah, could you see him? All his head bound up. But let us haste. There is no one by his bed, and if he try to rise, sir, he might die. Dragging him toward the right. Come, through the chapel. Tis the quickest way. Appearing on the steps and seeing Libre go away by the colonnade leading to the chapel door. Monsieur Libre. Libre and Raganu disappear without answering. Libre goes when I call. Tis some new trouble of good Raganos. She descends the steps. Scene four. Roxa alone. Two sisters for a moment. Ah, oh, what a beauty in September's close. My sorrows eased. April's joy dazzled it. But autumn wins it with her dying calm. She seats herself at the embroidery frame. Two sisters come out of the house and bring a large armchair under the tree. There comes the famous armchair where he sits. Dear faithful friend. It is the parlor's best. Thanks, sister. The sisters go. He'll be here now. She seats herself. A clock strikes. The hour strikes. My silks. Why, now the hour's struck. How strange to be behind his time at last, today. Perhaps the portress, where's my thimble? Here, is preaching to him. A pause. Yes, she must be preaching. Surely he must come soon. Ah, a dead leaf. She brushes off the leaf from her work. Nothing besides could scissors in my bag could hinder him. Second sister, coming to the steps. Monsieur de Bergerac. Scene 5. Roxanne, Cyrano, and, for a moment, Sister Martha. Without turning round. What was I saying? She embroiders. Cyrano, very pale, his hat pulled down over his eyes, appears. The sister, who had announced him, retires. He descends the steps, slowly, with a visible difficulty in holding himself upright. Bearing heavily on his cane, Roxa still works at her tapestry. Time has dimmed the tints. How harmonize them now? To Cyrano, with playful reproach. For the first time. Late! For the first time, all these fourteen years. Cyrano, who has succeeded in reaching the chair and has seated himself in a lively voice, which is in great contrast with his pale face. Aye, it is villainous! I raged, was stayed, by, by a bold, unwelcome visitor, absently, working, some creditor, I, cousin, the last creditor who has a debt to claim from me. And you have paid it? No, not yet. I put it off. Said, cry you, mercy, this is Saturday, when I have get a standing rendezvous that not defers. Call in an hour's time. Oh, well, a creditor can always wait. I shall not let you go ere twilight falls. Happily, perforce, I quit you ere it falls. He shuts his eyes and is silent for a moment. Sister Martha crosses the park from the chapel to the flight of steps. Roxa, seeing her, signs to her to approach. To Cyrano. How now? You have not teased the sister? Hastily opening his eyes. True. In a comically loud voice. Sister, come here. The sister glides up to him. Ha ha! What, those bright eyes bent ever on the ground? Sister Martha, who makes a movement of astonishment on seeing his face. Oh! In a whisper, pointing to Roxa. Hush! Tis not! Loudly, in a blustering voice. I broke fast yesterday! Aside. I know, I know. That's how he is so pale. Come presently to the refectory. I'll make you drink a famous bowl of soup. You'll come. Aye, aye! There, see, you are more reasonable today. Who hears them whispering? The sister would convert you. Nay, not I. Hold, but it's true. You preach to me no more, you once so glib with holy words. I am astonished. Stay, I will surprise you too. Hark, I permit you. 
he pretends to be seeking for something to tease her with and to have found it it is something new to pray for me tonight at chapel time oh oh good sister martha is struck dumb gently i did not wait your leave to pray for you she goes out turning to roxon who is still bending over her work that tapestry beshrew me if my eyes will ever see it finished i was sure to hear that well-known jest a light breeze causes the leaves to fall the autumn leaves lifting her head and looking down the distant alley soft golden brown like a venetian's hair see how they fall ay see how brave they fall in their last journey downward from the bow to rot within the clay yet lovely still hiding the horror of the last decay with all the wayward grace of careless flight what melancholy you collecting himself nay nay roxanne then let the dead leaves fall the way they will and chat what have you nothing new to tell my court gazette listen ah growing whiter and whiter saturday the nineteenth having eaten to excess of pear conserve the king felt feverish the lancet quelled this treasonable revolt and the august pulse beats at normal pace at the queen's ball on sunday thirty score of best white waxen tapers were consumed our troops they say have chased the austrians four sorcerers were hanged the little dog of madame d'atiste took a dose i bid you hold your tongue monsieur de bergerac monday not much claire changed protector oh whose face changes more and more tuesday the court repaired to fontainebleau wednesday the monglat said to comte de fiesque no thursday mancini queen of france almost friday the monglat to count fiesque said yes and saturday the twenty-sixth he closes his eyes his head falls forward silence surprised at his voice ceasing turns round looks at him and rising terrified he swoons she runs toward him crying cyrano opening his eyes in an unconcerned voice what is this he sees roxan bending over him and hastily pressing his hat on his head and shrinking back in his chair nay on my word tis nothing let me be but that old wound of arras sometimes as you know dear friend tis nothing twill pass soon he smiles with an effort see it has passed each of us has his wound i i have mine never healed up not healed yet my old wound she puts her hand on her breast tis here beneath this letter brown with age all stained with tear-drops and still stained with blood twilight begins to fall his letter ah uh, you promised me one day that i should read it what would you his letter yes i would fain to-day giving the bag hung at her neck see here it is taking it have i your leave to open open read she comes back to her tapestry frame holds it up sorts her wools reading roxanne adieu i soon must die this very night beloved and i feel my soul heavy with love untold i die no more as in days of old my loving longing eyes will feast on your least gesture i the least i mind me the way you touch your cheek with your finger softly as you speak ah me i know that gesture well my heart cries out i cry farewell but how you read that letter one would think continuing to read my life my love my jewel my sweet my heart has been yours in every beat the shades of evening fall imperceptibly you read in such a voice so strange and yet it is not the first time i hear that voice she comes nearer very softly without his perceiving it passes behind his chair and noiselessly leaning over him 
looks at the letter. The darkness deepens. Here, dying and there, in the land on high, I am he who loved, who loves you, I. Putting her hand on his shoulder. How can you read? It is too dark to see. He starts, turns, sees her close to him. Suddenly alarmed, he holds his head down. Then in the dusk, which has now completely enfolded them, she says, very slowly, with clasped hands, And fourteen years long, he has played this part of the kind old friend who comes to laugh and chat. Roxanne. Twas you. No, never. Roxanne, no. I should have guessed each time he said my name. No, it was not I. It was you. I swear. I see through all the generous counterfeit. The letters. You. No. The sweet, mad love words. You. No. The voice that thrilled the night. You. You. I swear you err. The soul. It was your soul. I loved you not. You loved me not. Twas he. You loved me. No. See how you falter now. No, my sweet love, I never loved you. Ah, oh. things dead, long dead. See how they rise again. Why, why keep silence all these fourteen years when on this letter, which he never wrote, the tears were your tears? Holding out the letter to her, the bloodstains were his. Why then that noble silence kept so long broken today for the first time. Why? Why? Libre and Raganu enter running. Scene 6. The same. Libre and Raganu. What madness! Here? I knew it well. Smiling and sitting up. What now? He has brought his death by coming, madame. God! Ah, then, that faintness of a moment since. Why, true. It interrupted the Gazette. Saturday, 26th, at dinner time. Assassination of de Bergerac. He takes off his hat. They see his head bandaged. What says he? Cyrano! His hat all bound. Ah, oh, what has chanced? How? Who? To be struck down, pierced by sword of the heart from a hero's hand that I had dreamed. O oh, mockery of fate! Killed I, of all men, in ambuscade, struck from behind, and by a lackey's hand. Tis very well. I am foiled, foiled in all, even in my death. Ah, oh, monsieur. Holding out his hand to him. Raguino, weep not so bitterly. What do you now, old comrade? Amid his tears. Trim the lights for Moliere's stage. Moliere? Yes, but I shall leave tomorrow. I cannot bear it. Yesterday they played scapin. I saw he'd thieved a scene from you. What? A whole scene? Oh, yes, indeed, monsieur. The famous one. Que diable allait-il faire? Moliere has stolen that? Tut! He did well. To Raganou. How went the scene? It told. I think it told. Sobbing. Ah, how they laughed. Look you, it was my life to be the prompter every one forgets. To Roxan. That night. When neath your window Christian spoke, under your balcony you remember, well, there was the allegory of my whole life, I in the shadow at the ladder's foot, while others lightly mount to love and fame, just, very just, here on the threshold drear of death I pay my tribute with the rest to Moliere's genius, Christian's fair face. The chapel bell chimes. The nuns are seen passing down the alley at the back to say their office. Let them go pray, go pray, when the bell rings. Rising and calling. Sister! Sister! Holding her fast. Call no one, leave me not. When you come back, I should be gone for I. The nuns have all entered the chapel. The organ sounds. I was somewhat fain for music. Hark, tis come. Live, for I love you. No, in fairy tales, when to the ill-starred prince the lady says, I love you, all his ugliness fades fast. 
but I remain the same up to the last. I have marred your life. I, I... You blessed my life. Never on me had rested woman's love. My mother even could not find me fair. I had no sister, and when grown a man, I feared the mistress who would mock at me. But I have had your friendship. Grace to you, a woman's charm has passed across my path. Pointing to the moon, which is seen between the trees. Your other lady love is come. Smiling. I see. I loved but once. Yet twice I lose my love. Hark you, Libre. I soon shall reach the moon. Tonight alone, with no projectile's aid. What are you saying? I tell you, it is there, there, that they send me for my paradise. There I shall find at last the souls I love. In exile, Galileo, Socrates. No, no, it is too clumsy, too unjust. So great a heart, so great a poet, die like this? What? Die? Hark to Livre, who scolds. Dear friend. Starting up, his eyes wild. What ho, cadets of Gascony! The elemental mass, ah, yes, the hic- His science still, he raves. Copernicus said. Oh. Mais que diable et l'est-il faire? Mais que diable l'est-il faire dans cette galère? Philosopher, metaphysician, rhymer, brawler, and musician, famed for his lunar expedition, and the outnumbered duels he fought, and lover also by interposition. Here lies Hercule Savien de Cyrano de Bergerac, who was everything yet was not. I cry your pardon, but I may not stay. See the moon ray that comes to call me hence. He has fallen back in his chair. The sobs of Roxa recall him to reality. He looks long at her, untouching her veil. I would not bid you mourn less faithfully that good, brave Christian. I would only ask that when my body shall be cold in clay, you wear those sable mourning weeds for two, and mourn a while for me in mourning him. I swear it, you. Shivering violently, then suddenly rising. Not there. What, seated? No. They spring toward him. Let no one hold me up. He props himself against the tree. Only the tree. Silence. It comes. Even now my feet have turned to stone. My hands are gloved with lead. He stands erect. But since death comes, I meet him still afoot. He draws his sword. And sword in hand. Cyrano. Half fainting. Cyrano. All shrink back in terror. Why, I well believe he dares to mock my nose. Ho! Insolent! He raises his sword. What say you? It is useless. Aye, I know, but who fights ever hoping for success? I fought for lost cause and for fruitless quest. You there, who are you? You are thousands. Ah, I know you now, old enemies of mine. Falsehood! He strikes in air with his sword. Have at you! Ha! And compromise! Prejudice! Treachery! He strikes. Surrender, I? Parley? No, never. You too? Folly, you? I know that you will lay me low at last, let be. Yet I fall fighting, fighting still. He makes passes in the air and stops, breathless. You strip from me the laurel and the rose. Take all. Despite you there is yet one thing I hold against you all. And when, tonight, I enter Christ's fair courts, and lowly bowed, sweep with doffed cask the heaven's threshold blue, one thing is left. That, void of stain or smutch, I bear away despite you. He springs forward, his sword raised. It falls from his hand. He staggers, falls back into the arms of Libre and Raganu. Roxa, bending and kissing his forehead. Tis. Opening his eyes, recognizing her and smiling. My panache. Curtain. End of Act 5. End of Cyrano de Berger.